Today's video is sponsored by Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. Every month they have a range of different products sure to meet the interest of everyone. With things ranging from clothing, outdoor gear, kitchen utensils, bar supplies, and so much more. 90% of their products come from small brands, many of which are based in the US. And these are high quality products too, such as this canvas weekender bag that has already become my go-to travel bag for when I need to get up and go. Or my compact camp chair that fits perfectly on my motorcycle, allowing me to relax after a long day's ride. And while that may not be what suits you or your interest, then don't worry. Bespoke Post has a personalized quiz that will help you find your perfect box. You can preview your box before it's shipped. You'll get a box of awesome assigned to you, and before it's shipped, you'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if you'd like to either keep it, swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. And don't expect to be shortchanged on your order. Every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value. To get 20% off your first box, click the link in the description and enter Cadaver at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com forward slash cadaver. Once again, use the link in the description below to get 20% off your first box of awesome today. On September 5th, 1982, in the city of Craig, Alaska, fishing boats flooded into Craig, much as they had the entire summer. The fishing season was coming to a close, and much of the city was filled with young fishermen eager to get paid after many of them had had a very successful and profitable season. One of these many fishermen was 28-year-old Mark Colthurst the captain of an enormous 58-foot fishing vessel, or a trawler, named the Investor. Mark was finishing the season with a recent catch of over 77,000 pounds of pink salmon, and after unloading the catch, he, along with his crew, docked the Investor at North Cove Dock. Mark's crew consisted of Mike Stewart, whom was Mark's cousin, Jerome Cohen, Dean Moon, all of which were 19, and Chris Heyman, who was 18. Accompanying the crew was Mark's wife, Irene, who was also 28, their daughter, Kimberly, and their son, John, aged 5 and 4, respectively. Irene was also three months pregnant at the time. Mark and his family made their way into town and had dinner at a restaurant called Ruth Ann's. They were celebrating Mark's birthday. While this was happening, Dean Moon and Jerome Cohen met up with another fisherman named John Kenneth Peel to purchase drugs from him. Peel was familiar with the crew as he used to actually be a part of Mark's crew. It is unknown if Chris Heyman and Mike Stewart made their way off the boat and headed into town. Nobody could recall seeing either man that night. So it is possible that both men simply stayed behind with the boat. Going back to Mark's timeline of events, he and his family finished their dinner and it was reported that they made their way back to the investor to wind down for the night. At the same time, the two boats that the investor was docked next to, the Decade and the Defiant, were having a party to celebrate the ending of a successful season. 
Several crewmates actually recall seeing Mark and his family making their way back to their boat, as it was reported that John said hello to some of them. Throughout the night, the party continued, even when a storm hit the area with very strong winds. With all of that noise, it would make many wonder if that was why what was about to occur never alerted anyone. Around 6 a.m. the following morning, as the morning sun was rising over Craig, a crew member of the decade was making his way to the dock and noticed the investor was slowly idling away. While no calls for alarm, as it was normal for boats to depart that early, what did stand out were the brand new tie-down lines that were left behind. This wasn't at all something crews would leave behind as they could easily be stolen and it was normal procedure to keep them on the boat when not in use. Yet when looking at the investor, the crew member of the decade did see someone piloting the boat, and whoever was on the boat actually waved at the crew member. Minutes later, the captain of the decade also saw the investor and saw a man, presumably the same man piloting the boat, now on the deck. Nobody made any fuss about the situation, so people went about their normal day and simply assumed Mark was taking the boat out early. A little over an hour later, at around 7.30 in the morning, a crewman of a different boat saw the investor anchored down near Fish Egg Island, which was across the harbor from Craig. Near the exact same time, a witness would later state that they saw a skiff from the investor at the cold storage dock back at Craig. That skiff would remain docked there for the rest of the day, and by 10.30 that morning, heavy fog had taken over Craig, and when the other boats prepared to depart for another day of fishing, the investor left the minds of many, even to the captain of the decade who actually radioed Mark that morning apologizing about the night prior and if the noise got too loud. Yet, no reply to that message was ever made. The next day, on Tuesday the 7th, the investor was still anchored at Fish Egg Island, to the surprise of many, as they assumed Mark had started his day before everyone else. Back on Craig, it was reported that a young man, perhaps 20 or 21 years old, was seen purchasing two and a half gallons of gasoline before departing upon the investor's skiff that was left out at cold storage the day before. The skiff was seen making its way back to the investor. Later in the afternoon, around 4 o'clock, the fishing boat, the casino, saw smoke coming from the investor. Police were alerted, and while waiting on their arrival, the casino made its way towards the investor to see if they could help in any way. As the casino was approaching the investor, the captain of the casino saw the same skiff now leaving the investor. It was later said that the captain had to practically ram the skiff to get him to stop, since yelling and blowing their horn did nothing to get the operator's attention. The casino captain asked if there were people on board the investor, and the young man simply replied with, Yes, there's people on that boat, before making his way towards Craig. Once arriving, he was reported to have spoken to at least three people before making his way into town. That was the last known sighting of this mysterious figure. Back at Fish Egg Island, the situation with the investor was growing rapidly out of control. The small fire had grown and was now completely engulfing the boat. The casino had attempted to be of some assistance, but due to the overwhelming heat, there was very little they could actually do. Police actually ended up having to call in a tugboat with a pump attached so they could get the fire under control. Unfortunately, that would take over two hours, and during that entire time, the investor would continue burning. Alaskan State Trooper Bob Anderson was the first to arrive and took control of the scene. During the time frame of waiting for the tugboat to arrive, Anderson knew that the fire was arson and sent word for an arson investigator to come to the scene. 
Around 7.30 that evening, the fire was finally put under control. Now at this point, the fire had been going non-stop for over three hours, so the damage to the inside of the boat was catastrophic. But even then, it couldn't hide what Trooper Anderson saw once he boarded the investor. Upon entering the investor, Trooper Anderson was met with a grisly scene. Apart from the inside of the cabin being burnt to a crisp with the fire gutting much of the interior, Trooper Anderson was able to quickly make out the charred remains of four people. Those remains would later go on to be identified as Mark Colehurst, his wife Irene, their five-year-old daughter Kimberly, and Mark's cousin, 19-year-old Mike Stewart. They were all said to have suffered multiple gunshot wounds. As the remains were recovered from the investor, the fire actually started growing in strength once again, and the boat had to be quickly abandoned. The fire would continue to rage on. Unable to fight the blaze, law enforcement kept a safe distance from the investor. At this time, Trooper Anderson made his way back to Craig, where he interviewed a witness who saw the man driving the skiff. This witness would go on to give a somewhat detailed report of this figure as a 20 to 21 year old white male with light brown or blonde hair weighing around 150 pounds. He wore glasses and a baseball hat with a logo on the front of it. This however came from the point of view of someone who saw him driving the skiff. So an accurate recounting of his features was virtually impossible and due to the fact that the description given matched with most every fisherman in the area, it wasn't as helpful as one could have hoped. The following day, the fire continued to burn on the investor, and that was when troopers made the call to use a helicopter to dump water on the boat. Why they waited a full day to do this was anyone's guess. There could have been numerous factors that played into why something like a helicopter wasn't used earlier. But it is frustrating, knowing that the crime scene was literally being engulfed in flames and it was left to do that for a full day. Again, this is not me attacking law enforcement for not handling the scene correctly, but from an outside perspective, there seems to be more that could have been done in the moment to combat the fire. Once the investor was fully extinguished, it was towed back to Craig and placed at the dock. This is where another move by the police baffles me, as they didn't secure the area and left it completely unguarded, allowing whoever so wanted to come in and look at the wreckage, potentially destroying or damaging any possible evidence left behind. Not to mention the rising tide from that day no doubt played a factor in quite literally washing away the evidence. Evidence mishandling plays a large part in this case, if you couldn't tell. When the investor was finally examined by the arson investigator, one of the first things that was discovered were the remains that were identified later on as Jerome Cohen. Various bone fragments were discovered and collected, but could never be fully determined to belong to either Chris Herman or Dean Moon. The remains of five-year-old John Colthurst would never be discovered and many investigators believe that due to his size, he was completely consumed by the fire. After the investigation of the investor, it was determined by police that eight people had been killed. From here, police were now faced with finding who was responsible for this horrendous crime, and they in fact already had their prime suspect. Unfortunately, that person matched a description with many on the island. So for police, it would be like finding a needle in a pile of needles.
During the direct aftermath of the investor fire, law enforcement was quickly overwhelmed with not only piecing together the crime itself, but also the city of Craig demanding answers. During the investigation, the autopsies were performed on the remains found on board of the investor. I mentioned earlier that Mark and Irene would both be identified from this. One interesting thing that did come out in terms of the gunshot wounds was the report that was given to Alaskan law enforcement and was later told to the media that preliminary indications are that Mark and Irene Colthurst were victims of homicide and possibly may have died prior to the fire. The same outcome would be made for both Kimberly Colthurst and Mike Stewart, that they were killed before the fire ever occurred. And looking at how the scene actually played out, this is hard to argue against. This, however, will be discussed later on in the video. As the investigation continued, it was learned just how much everything was mishandled. One of those being that when an officer was told about the skiff that was seen leaving the investor and then docked at Craig, instead of actually impounding it, the officer simply looked over it and left figuring that the rain would have washed away any evidence. As the police continued their searching, somewhat of a theory was put forth by law enforcement on the events of the night of the 5th. The night that Mark and his family went to eat at the restaurant. The theory went that Mark and his family were ambushed when they arrived back at their boat. They said this due to Irene still being in the same clothes as she was seen in that night. It went on to say that the reason no gunshots were heard were due to the loudness of the party that night from both the Defiant and the Decade. The fire was an afterthought, or a plan B if you want to call it that. When examining the investor, police noticed that the seacocks were open, putting together that whoever did this may have thought that anchoring the boat and then doing this would cause it to sink, and due to the amount of fog, nobody would see it happening. Yet, when the day came and when the investor was still floating, the idea to instead burn it came into play. The state of the investigation had little progress in terms of naming any suspects for over a year. After coming through evidence and theorizing to no end, many in law enforcement felt that overall they were no closer to actually catching whoever was responsible. Eventually, after gathering more eyewitness accounts, a detailed rendering of the suspect was released to the public. And almost instantly, several people came forward, all saying that the sketch looked very similar and identified the person as John Kenneth Peel, the same man who I mentioned earlier in the video, and someone who had a troubled history with Mark Colthurst. On September 10, 1984, a little over two years since the crime occurred, John Kenneth Peel was arrested and charged with both the arson and eight counts of murder. The evidence against Peel, though, was circumstantial at best, with witness reports stating that Peel was the one who was seen both in the skiff and getting the gasoline, and that Peel had motive for the crime since in the past he worked for Mark, but had been fired by him in the previous season due to Pill's consistent alcohol and drug abuse. So the prosecution was going to paint the picture of a man who both sold and used drugs and with a chip on his shoulder took revenge on Mark Colthurst and his family. The other crewmates were also killed out of both jealousy for having replaced Peel and also to remove any loose ends. While yes, this somewhat can fit a certain narrative, this can get messy really quickly because suddenly you will make every theory or piece of evidence fit the narrative in some way. During the court case, the defense picked apart the prosecution's theory, 
starting with the eyewitness reports that claimed to see Peel both purchasing the gasoline and also operating the skiff. Noting multiple inconsistencies in the eyewitness testimonies and calling attention to several eyewitness reports where their stories had changed from two years ago. It was even mentioned by several people who saw whoever driving the skiff that making any type of accurate description would be incredibly hard, if not impossible, to accomplish. The defense also went against the motive as revenge. Sure, John and Mark may have had a falling out and didn't end on the best terms, but for the reaction to be to murder Mark and his entire family over it seems not only like a severe overreaction, but it just seemed that they were trying their best to make something fit. Even then, if John Peel did do this, how could one man have not been overpowered by eight people? Okay, sure, two of them were children, but you still had six others that could have easily overwhelmed just one person. To further weaken the theory that John Peel was responsible was the Colthurst family themselves. They actually came to the aid of John and said not only does it not fit his character to do such a crime, but given that he had always been such a friendly and easygoing guy, and that for the most part actually got along with Mark. Yes, they did have a falling out, but that also had to do with Mark having a strict no-drug policy on his ship. So yes, I understand why Mark fired John. After all, being a fisherman is a very dangerous job, and if you are either intoxicated or under the influence of a drug, then that exponentially makes the risk that much greater. Another smaller detail that, like many things during this trial, was subject to intense discrepancy were the transcripts of Peel's interview with police. The prosecution argued that during those interviews, Peel said, I'm scared, man. I'm scared. I can't believe the things I did in there. That alone sounds incredibly damning. Yet, the defense went on to say that Peel actually said, I'm scared, man. And this is just one of the many things that went back and forth. In fact, both the prosecution and the defense were scolded by the judge for how the trial was going on. And several times, the prosecutors and Pill's lawyers would actually begin arguing with each other in the courtroom. Add this with the allegations that the prosecution were intimidating witnesses, the police mishandling evidence, and the witch hunt that followed the crime in which it seems someone needed to be arrested for it regardless of their guilt. The biggest back and forth were the eyewitness statements though. There were those who claimed to have seen John Peel arguing with Mark the night of the crime. And then you would have someone say that Mark and John were actually having a friendly conversation. You would have people saying that they saw John with a rifle standing on the dock, when you'd have another saying that that same rifle had been locked away all night. The back and forth with the witness statements made any argument from that standpoint incredibly weak for both the prosecution and the defense. In the end, the trial of John Kenneth Pill ended with a hung jury, with the jury voting 7-5 to five for acquittal. Two years later, Pill would again be tried for the crime and with essentially no new evidence brought to the table and with the defense not calling any eyewitnesses, while risky, paid off as three months later, John Kenneth Peel was found not guilty and all charges had been dropped. While the court case of John Kenneth Peel was over, for many, the case was back to square one. It had now been close to six years since the crime and no new suspects had been named and no closure had been given to the families. With the aftermath of John Kenneth Pill's verdict and being found not guilty, the case of what happened on the investor came to a standstill. And like many things involved in true crime, 
theories on what happened began to fill the cracks and possibly offer solutions to the matter. The number of theories on this case are in no way few. The only problem is, many of them seem like complete shots in the dark. Yet, there are a few that I want to go over. The first that I will start with is the man that I just covered, John Kenneth Peel. There are many in Craig, and also many who have heard this case, who believe that Peel was the one responsible for the crime and that he acted alone. Given his apparent rough relationship with Mark, I can, at the very least, see why there could be hostility between the two men. Being fired from a job is never fun, and anger is a normal emotion to have. Where it gets thin for me is what followed with the crime itself. I personally don't see how getting laid off from a job, for what I might add is a valid reason, is cause for wiping out an entire family and every deckhand on the investor, let alone the conflicting reports of John and Mark settling their differences in the past and were reported as being friendly with each other on the night of the crime. But even looking past all of that, on if John and Mark did manage to lead the past in the past, or if John decided to get revenge, it still doesn't add up to me. How can one man manage to keep control of a situation where six adults were present? How did nobody manage to overwhelm him, even if he had a gun? If all six of them rushed him, then obviously he would not have come out the victor there. On top of that, why would he act alone when he knew that there were four other men who had no direct ties to why he wanted revenge? Could it have been jealousy or envy that drove him to also include the other crew, or could it have simply been him trying to tie up loose ends? Another thing that causes me to have issues with this was John himself was a father, a new one at that. Now, I know people in the past, even serial killers, have had a normal family life on the outside, and they've also harmed children, Dennis Rader, for example, and countless others. But for this man, who was a new father, to do that to kids whom he knew on top of that makes me lean that if Pill did do this, then I don't believe he acted alone. Perhaps his beef was solely with Mark, and if others were involved, they knew that everyone had to be silenced. However, there are potential theories as to why Pill could have been responsible, one of them being that obviously Mark was doing well for himself in the fishing business. The investor, after all, was a massive 58-foot boat that cost around $850,000. It was said to have been state-of-the-art at the time, and perhaps Pill, seeing the success that Mark was now having, drove his anger and resentment over the limit, and he took to murder as the answer. The answer is pretty cut and dry, yes, but sometimes in violent crimes, the most plausible answer is the correct one. One other thing that I wanted to point out is Pill himself was a fisherman and clearly knew his way around the boat. On the morning when the investor was taken to Fish Egg Island, it was said to have been anchored there with the sea cocks opened, allowing in theory for the boat to simply sink. It does to me, at least, tell me whoever was responsible clearly knew their way around a boat and how to operate one. The boat not sinking could have been due to the boat being state of the art, or another factor could have caused it to not sink. But I do feel that the fire was an afterthought. Since the boat didn't sink, whoever did the crime knew that somehow the boat needed to be destroyed. Another theory, while admittedly having no actual evidence, was that Mark Colthurst was using his boat as not only a means of fishing, but also as a means to smuggle... How do I say this without the algorithm punishing me? Let's say he was smuggling things that rhyme with hugs. And due to the nature of his work, it landed him on the wrong side of some bad people, and that he and his family paid the ultimate price. Again, there is zero evidence to back up this claim, but the accusation came due to the investor itself. As I just mentioned, the boat was over $800,000, and Mark was young at the time of the crime. He was only 28, and for him to have that impressive of a ship did raise some eyebrows as to how he was even able to acquire it. There were also rumors that had spread that due to the very nature of the fishing business, that enemies could very easily be made, and that Mark had more than a few. This, I can see as truthful. Not just the fishing business, but any in that sense. When it comes to big money being on the table, 
Having people wanting to see you disappear, for lack of better words, isn't that uncommon. Perhaps this was the outcome that met with Mark, but instead of it being over the fishing industry, it was over a different one altogether. Yet, what stands out as something that should be somewhat obvious is if Mark was in fact in bed with a cartel or other shady practice, then I would think if members of an outside organization showed up in a small town like Craig, then they would have been very noticeable. Yet, no reports had been made of people appearing shady or standing out. Granted, the town was full of people coming and going off of boats, and many reported that all of the faces looked the same. But still, I feel that if several outside faces appeared and then disappeared, then it would have been at least seen by a few people. This would, however, have certain things make sense, such as leaving the tie-down lines on the dock instead of taking them on the boat, and assuming that the boat would sink by opening the seacocks. But that one part is what I am torn on, because I can see both sides. On one hand, I could see that someone would need to know what those are and what they do, and that they could cause a boat to sink. Yet, on the other hand, it makes me wonder if they just tried anything to make the boat sink, and when it didn't, they resorted to burning it. I mean, me personally, I had no idea what seacocks even were before researching this case, and I didn't even know that they were a part of a boat. Then again, and I apologize if I keep fixating on this, but why would they even wait around for a full day to make sure the boat sank? I mean, why do it during the morning anyway? Why not simply do it at night when people were obviously distracted by the party? This theory, in the end, for me at least, doesn't add up, and I personally feel isn't true. Another theory is one that I find particularly interesting. Another individual who was at Craig on the night of the 5th, a man who threw himself into the investigation and who had a troubled history. The man I am referring to is Jim Leroy Miller. He was someone who had supposedly been one of the witnesses pointing out Pill as the person seen in the skiff. Miller even testified to that during the first trial against Peel. Yet, following the events of that first trial, things began to come to light about Jim Leroy Miller. One of those things was that his name was actually Kenneth Harvey Robertson, a convicted arsonist who had a history of violence. He was in fact a fugitive who was wanted in the state of Arizona. The crime? Burning down a building. On top of that, even more suspicious was that Robertson had a history with violence against women, going so far as to burn some vehicles owned by various women in his past. And to add even more to this already charming man was that he also threatened to kill his ex-wife's entire family. The background alone should have been enough to look into Robertson as a potential suspect. I mean, law enforcement was so dead set on charging Peel with the crime that they seemingly missed this individual who had a history of not only violence, but also arson, who was living under a fake name. From everything that I have read, nothing came of Robertson in relation to this crime. He was never formally charged, and I can only assume never interviewed. I am not saying that Kenneth Harvey Robertson was responsible in any way with what happened. But I am saying that given his background, he should have, at the very least, been looked into. Yet, he never was. One final theory, be it a small one, was that since Dean Moon and Chris Heyman and John Colthurst's body were never recovered, it was theorized that perhaps Dean and Chris played a part in the crime. I won't entertain much of this as, again, the lack of any proof, but it is somewhat surprising that the remains of Chris and Dean were never found, when Mike and Jerome's were. There have been talks here and there of seeing Dean and Chris around the state of Washington, yet nothing concrete has ever come forward. And also given that it was reported that one of Dean's teeth was later identified when examining the remains, and on top of all of that, that there have been no confirmed sightings of either Dean or Chris by friends or family since 1982, I feel that both of these men met the same tragic fate as the others. There was a theory that John Colthurst had survived and had been taken by whoever committed this crime, as again, his remains were never found. 
Yet, I have found no actual evidence supporting this other than falling into the category of, well, it could have happened. Personally, my biggest reason for not believing this is Kimberly. Why would they not take Kimberly? If whoever this was was already taking one child, why not take the other? The age gap between them was only one year, so I can't imagine why someone would do what they did to Kimberly and not do the same to John. Why take one and leave the other? I unfortunately feel that John, along with all of the others, suffered the same fate. since the investor mystery. And with most of the police force and Craig deeming the case to be closed as they view John Kenneth Peel as getting away with it, it doesn't leave much in terms of hope that this case will ever truly be solved. What we do know is that on September 5th, 1982, eight lives, nine if you count Irene being pregnant, were taken in one of the worst ways imaginable. To those in Craig, the story still remains as a shadow that will never fully go away. To have such a loss of life and to have no resolution is something that in and of itself is a greater tragedy than the crime. I can only hope that one day justice is fully served and whoever was responsible, whether mentioned in this video or not, can finally pay for their crimes. Until then, however, the story of the investor will continue on as one of Alaska's darkest mysteries. Andre Mendoza may be a name that many of you are unfamiliar with. I myself hadn't heard about him until just recently. And while his name may not be as recognizable as Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy, Andre Mendoza is no less evil and just another example that monsters do exist and they live among us. Andre Mendoza is a name that for many in the area of Atizapan thought of as a harmless old man who was known to be somewhat annoying at times when he was drunk, but overall nobody thought him capable of hurting another person. He was a trusted member of the community and at one point was even the president of the Citizen Participation Council. With him being so close to the community, he was able to avoid any and all suspicion when it came to people going missing in the area. Even when there were signs that something seemed off, especially when there were several times when the smell of burnt meat would be coming from his home. Many in the area chalked it up to his profession as a butcher, and the smell, while nasty, was nothing to be alarmed over. This isn't to say, though, that Andre was the picture-perfect person around the area. There were numerous reports of him being drunk in public and being labeled as a pervert when he was under the influence. A very stark contrast to the quiet and harmless old man when sober. Some even said that when he was drunk that he was completely unrecognizable with his actions. Yet sober or not, on May 14th, 2021, Reina Gonzalez, a longtime friend of Andre's, arrived at his home to buy parts for a cell phone. As Reina owned a cell phone business and over the years, Andre's had been a customer of Reina's several times. The problem arose when Reina did not return home and her husband, Bruno Portillo, a police officer, became worried. He made his way over to the home of Andres to figure out what happened and if he had even seen Reina. Bruno was simply wanting to ask Andres the last time that he saw Reina and if she even made it to his house. In no way did Bruno suspect Andres in any way, at least at first. 
The suspicion began to grow shortly after Bruno arrived. Andres met him at the door and refused to let Bruno inside his home. Andres was also acting very nervous and somewhat aggressive when answering any question Bruno asked him. Bruno left shortly after and immediately made his way to the police station to report his wife missing and also on the suspicious nature of Andres. Shortly after the first visit, several other police officers arrived at Andreas' home, and after an argument which turned into a struggle, Andreas was handcuffed and placed in the back of a police car while police conducted their search. Around this time, a report was made to the police at the scene that surveillance footage showed Reina arriving and entering Andreas' home, but never leaving. When police entered the house, unknown to them, instead of walking into a simple house that looked like any other, they instead walked into something that was straight out of a horror movie. Police saw firsthand the depraved and nightmarish behavior of Andres Mendoza. The first thing that was seen were numerous knives and machetes covered in blood on both the counters and the table. There were also trash bags of various sizes littered around the home, and when opened, Police were met with the sight of body parts crudely stuffed into each of these bags. The search continued and police then found a small opening to a basement and as they made their way inside, the smell of death was becoming stronger and stronger. Inside of the basement was something truly out of a nightmare. Not only were human bones scattered literally everywhere, but both body parts fresh and others very old were on multiple tables. Bag after bag were removed from the home, and Bruno watched on until he had to be escorted off the premises. A broken man, now knowing the fate of his wife, and seeing the monster that was responsible for her demise. Andres was taken to the nearest police station and held there while the home became flooded with police, crime scene techs, and the media. There were some who noted that this was very similar to when police were clearing the house of John Wayne Gacy, and as the local population watched on in horror that someone they knew was capable of such evil, it was about to become much worse. An important thing to note here is that this is still a developing story, and that there have been articles about the ongoing investigation as recent as July 4th of 2022. So, when I say that as of the date of this upload, there have been a total of 4,600 bones that have been recovered from his home, all human, there is a chance that the number could very well increase. Initially, with the first investigation, 3,787 bones were removed, and Andres was immediately charged with Reina's death. With the original 3,787 bones removed, Forensic was able to separate them and state that they belonged to at least 19 different people altogether, 17 of those being women, one being a child, and one being an adult male. And this may come as either a shock to everyone or as no surprise, but as of the date of this upload, Andres has only been charged with five murders. The remaining are still being sorted out, but one of those five, and the one that got him life in prison, was Reina. Andres has been said to be very cooperative with police on this matter, and has gone on record as saying, I don't deny anything. I blame myself. All I want is to tell the truth. I've done it, and that's it. One weird thing about this case is that Andres has confessed to 30 different killings, yet he has not admitted guilt over Reina. One theory on this matter is that he could feel a lot of guilt about her since he actually knew her and was friends with her. He stated that the majority of his victims were all strangers that he met in bars. He then said that he would invite them back to his house and when they would reject any advance that he would make, he would fly into a rage. And well, you can guess the outcome there. Andres has stated that his first victim was in 2007, and with his confessions, Mexican police have been able to close, or at the very least, link several missing persons cases to him. Andres has also said that he was inspired by the film The Silence of the Lambs, and enjoyed keeping accounts of every single one of his victims. Police were able to back those accounts up by presenting a notebook found in his home, containing entries of the victims' names, descriptions, and even some having a date next to their name. 
Andres has also kept souvenirs of all of his victims, ranging from things like wallets, IDs, earrings, clothing items, nail polish, purses, a hair dryer, cell phones, pictures, and a few necklaces. Police investigating this horrific crime have also been said to have come across films that Andres recorded of his victims both before and after death. But those tapes, if they exist, have not been shown to the public, and I think that is for the best. Andres has been seen by several psychologists to try to get a better understanding of why he committed these horrible crimes. While that is still an ongoing investigation, Andres has given slight glimpses into his frame of mind. As one psychologist reported, it was a hatred, a huge hostility towards the female figure. Andres himself had this to say, I always thought women were very cold and manipulative and that they always changed me and caused me to be this violent man. It was later said that because of his low self-esteem and hatred of women, he would make them his victims to not only feel a sense of power, but in his mind, acceptance from them as well. And as twisted as that sounds, what Andreas said after his conviction was enough to sicken the entire country. See, Andres didn't just end the lives of some of these women. He went a step further and gave in to his cannibalistic desires. And not only that, but also felt that others should as well. Andres, being a butcher, was said to have served his victims to unknown people all around the area. While none of this can be fully confirmed, they are said to be true by Andres. And whether or not it is true, or just a twisted story to strike further fear into the area, it is only truly known by the monster himself. Andres Mendoza is proof that the monsters we imagine as kids are nothing compared to what people like him are capable of. And to give you a full and clear picture to the type of evil that Andre Mendoza is, I will end this with a quote from him when talking about one of his victims. I removed the skin from her face simply because she was very pretty. Ever since we have been kids, our parents, teachers, and even the media has warned us about stranger danger and how best to avoid them. But even then, it's no full guarantee that you will always be safe, and you may truly never know a person's intentions until it is far too late. This is the type of situation that Heather Soul found herself in on the night of July 18th, 2015 when she crossed paths with a man named Neil Falls. Neil Falls, by many accounts now, are that he was a very mysterious individual. While not much is known about him, what is known is that for several years, he was living in various places around Nevada and was employed as a security guard for the Hoover Dam. He was said to be very friendly and polite by his friends, and he was a person who rarely drank and never consumed drugs. He did, however, have a large interest in firearms and was an avid collector of them. He also frequently abused animals and due to this, he alienated himself away from many of his co-workers. The thing about Neil was that he seemed to be welcoming and inviting enough to be his friend, yet when someone would get close, he would show the darker version of himself that would eventually make people keep him at a distance. From 2009 to 2015, Neil moved all over the country and was living in Indiana, Oregon, Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, New York, Nevada, Arizona, and Texas. He also had numerous run-ins with the police over traffic violations. Yet, with all of those interactions with police, Neil was never seen as a threat to the public and nobody knew of the dark secret that he was hiding. Neil was also said to frequent prostitutes and going so far as to travel to the Philippines in 2005 for the sole purpose of having a different partner every night 
if you catch my drift. The almost never-ending desire he had for Parker Coogan is exactly how Neil Falls and Heather Saul met on July 15, 2015. Neil Falls found Heather Saul's on the now since shut down website Backpage. Once some back and forth messages and information was exchanged, Neil made his way to Heather's residence and once arriving, he closed the door behind him and said to Heather, do you want to live or die? Wasting little time, Neil pulled out a pistol and aimed it at Heather, demanding her to lay on the ground. As Heather complied, Neil began yelling at her more and without hesitation, he began to strangle her. Realizing that it was time to either accept death or fight back, Heather tried her best to fight, scratching at his face and eventually grabbing a small rake and began striking Neil in the face with it. This is where Neil made his fatal flaw as he placed the gun down to grab the rake and as soon as he did that, Heather grabbed the gun and shot him. Within a matter of seconds, Heather's would-be killer was now laying on the ground, dead. In shock, Heather began screaming and when she regained her composure, she quickly grabbed the phone and called the police. When police arrived, they found Heather frantic and scared. They took her away from the scene and then began to search Neil and his car. On his person, they found items that would make anyone's blood run cold. They found four sets of handcuffs as well as a knife. Even more was found in his car as they found a machete, an axe, more knives, a shovel, a sledgehammer, bleach, trash bags, bulletproof vest, socks, and a spare change of clothes. What was obviously apparent from the discovery of these items, as well as Heather's story, was that Neil was very much planning on killing Heather, but as the shock of the event began to settle, police started connecting the dots that made this story go from what was thought of as an isolated incident to something much larger. Police started to piece together Neil's movements to the areas in which he lived in because things didn't seem to add up to the police with the aftermath of the event with Heather. Police obviously noticed the weapons that he brought with him along with the bleach and change of clothes and it told them that he was very organized. A bigger picture started being painted as Neil's MO was able to be linked to his previous locations. During the time he lived in Nevada from 2003 to 2007, four women disappeared, all with the same professions as Heather. Three of those four women would later be found dismembered in Illinois and Nevada. Six more women disappeared from Ohio, two hours away from where Neil himself was living at the time. All of these women had one thing that linked all of them together. They all advertised themselves on websites like Backpage and various others. Even more damning was at the scene of the crime with Heather, a list was found on Neil's person that contained the names of six women along with their phone numbers. Thankfully, these six women were all found alive and safe. Police have theorized that they could have been potential victims for Neil. Since 2015, police have actively been looking into Neil's past and not only where he lived, but as well as any disappearances that match the MO of Neil Falls. As of right now, no known victims have been able to be fully tied to Neil, but there are currently, as of the date of this upload, eight potential victims of Neil Falls. Those eight are Jody Brewer, Lindsay Marie Harris, Misty Marie Sains, Tiffany Sayer, Shasta Himmelrich, Charlotte Trago, Tamika Lynch, and Wanda Lemons. The mystery that surrounds Neil Falls on if he were in fact a serial killer is still debated to this day. Nobody can say for certain that he was, yet nobody can disregard him either. The only thing for certain is that he was clearly planning on making Heather either his first victim or just another one for him to add to his overall total. Heather Saul has since moved on with her life and has even been featured in the documentary called The Killing Season. There are many who credit her with having stopped an active serial killer. The even more crazy thing is that Heather managed to fight off Neil while having a broken back and a dislocated shoulder and still overcame him and saved her own life. Without her determination to fight back, who knows how many more women Neil Falls would have gone on to harm. 
While we may never truly know how many victims, if any, Neil Falls had, what is known is that a very bad man was stopped by a person who wouldn't go down without a fight. I have covered some very bizarre things on this channel, ranging from a woman who was labeled as missing, even though there were many in her family that still maintain contact with her and know her general location, to a town bully who was killed in broad daylight with over a dozen witnesses, yet decades later, nobody has been arrested for it. Needless to say, there is not much that I come across that genuinely shocks me and plays out like something out of a modern mystery bestseller. Then, about a week ago, I came across a story revolving around a little girl whose entire existence has been entangled in mystery, tragedy, and darkness. The little girl that you are seeing on screen right now is Bo Ram, known throughout a lot of Korean media simply as Baby Bo Ram. And on February 10th, 2021, a crime would be reported that would turn from tragic to something that is still to this day leaving people with questions and many so disgusted with those involved that they cannot tell what is true and what is just another lie. But before I get ahead of myself, let's go back to the beginning. February 10th, 2021. In the city of Gumi in South Korea, an older couple received a phone call from their landlord informing them that their daughter, named Kim, had not been heard from for several months and that her rent hadn't been paid. The older couple that the landlord had called were the parents of Kim, her mother, Suk, and Suk's husband. Concerned of this information and given that they lived in the same apartment complex as Kim, Suk and her husband made their way up to Kim's apartment and once inside were met with a very eerie and quiet scene. The entire apartment was empty of almost all furnishings and it appeared the apartment had been empty for some time as Suk peeked into every room to check if anything had been left behind she finally made her way to her granddaughter's bedroom and that was when she saw something no parent or grandparent should ever have to experience Suk screamed as she saw the body of her granddaughter three-year-old boram completely mummified. Sook screamed for her husband and after frantically trying to do anything to save the little girl, they quickly knew that she had passed away months ago. Sook's husband quickly called the police and once they arrived, they sailed off the area and began searching for any signs of Kim as now they had no idea if she was also missing and potentially in danger or if she played a part in what happened to Baram. The police were able to quickly find Kim and found it shocking that she was not even attempting to hide from them. She was actually openly living with another man whom she had recently married and even more shocking and disturbing was that Kim had given birth to another child. Kim was arrested and taken in for questioning about Baram. And that was when Kim admitted to leaving behind Baram due to her being pregnant with her current child and that she didn't want to keep Baram any longer. As disgusting as these actions of Kim's were, Kim actually began to piece together a story to horrified and shocked officers as to why she did what she did. So, back in April of 2020, Kim and her first husband and the father of Boram, Hong, were divorcing due to Kim having an affair with her now current husband. Hong, who was not in the best financial situation during the divorce, requested that Kim take care of Boram while he worked and got himself into a better position to raise her. Kim agreed to this, but also informed police that she spent all of April and May neglecting the child and eventually grew to resent her as she reminded her of Hong. Because of this and the pregnancy of her second child, Kim eventually decided to just move out of the apartment and move in with her now current husband, leaving her child, Baram, behind in the apartment. 
And as shocking as these accusations were, they were all true. And as more from this story began to be revealed, the more this story would begin to blend tragedy and mystery into straight out confusion. Shortly after Kim's arrest, a DNA test was performed on Kim and Baram, and the results that came back revealed that Kim was not actually Baram's mother, but instead, she was Baram's sister. Now, yes, I was having the same thought going through my mind that a lot of you are probably having right now. And as crazy as it sounds, it was proven by DNA that Baram was indeed not the daughter of Kim, but instead the daughter of Kim's mother, Suk. And this is where this story gets even more flipped upside down. Suk refuted all claims that Baram was her daughter, but the DNA test was verified four different times and DNA has a track record of not lying. So with even irrefutable evidence presented to her, Suk still denied that Baram was her daughter. A bigger shock came out later when looking back at the birth of Baram, because many wondered how people even figured Kim was the mother if she was never pregnant. Well, that's the thing. When Baram was born, Kim was also pregnant. So both Sook and Kim, mother and daughter, gave birth within days apart. To add even more confusion to this entire story, Sook's husband wasn't the father since Sook was having multiple affairs as well with numerous other men, and one of them got her pregnant, and that pregnancy led to baby Baram. Shortly after this information came out, both Kim and Sook were arrested, and police were trying their best to figure out exactly what happened with Baram's birth, how Sook hid the fact that she was pregnant from her husband, how she managed to hide that Baram was hers for over three years, and the biggest question, if Baram was Sook's, then where was Kim's baby? Some of these questions still do not have any answers, unfortunately. But from what I was able to learn from the story was that this all came from a bitter falling out between Kim and Sook. Kim never got along with her mother and Sook felt that she had failed as a parent and for years had told people, including her husband, that she wished she had another chance to be a better parent and have a good relationship with her daughter. Yet nobody thought these were the words of someone who would eventually make that happen. Police have put together somewhat of a timeline from what happened with Baram's birth and Kim's pregnancy. What police have theorized was that when Kim was in the hospital and had delivered her baby, Sook, like any grandmother, wanted to be there to help look after the infant while the mother recovered from giving birth. Police believe this is where the swap happened, as Sook had her child days before giving birth to baby Baram. This is when Sook swapped Kim's baby with Baram. There unfortunately was no information as of today on Kim's baby and what happened to the infant. What some think happened is that Sook took Kim's baby and put the baby up for adoption, but that in and of itself has holes in it and can easily be argued against. We also still have no idea who the actual biological father of Baram is, as again, due to the numerous affairs Sook was having, it has been proven difficult to find the father. And then, the biggest twist came after Sook and Kim had been arrested. What came out from Sook was a confession that shows just how twisted both Sook and Kim truly are. Sook confessed that Kim called her one day and told her that she had left Baram behind. She told her that Baram was dead and that she didn't know what to do. Sook told Kim that she would, in her own words, take care of it. Phone records of the phone call taking place were proven shortly after this confession. On top of that, police were able to get evidence that one day before the phone call was made that started this entire shocking case that Sook actually went into the apartment and attempted to get rid of the remains. But she was scared by a gust of wind that actually slammed the bedroom door closed and Sook became so frightened that she ran out of the apartment. She then came up with the plan to discover the body the next day. However, what I am shocked about is how they thought they would get away with any of this. 
I'm not sure if it was due to guilt that Sook had felt and that is why she called the police or maybe she banked on them not doing the DNA test and could have hoped that the police would have thought the remains weren't Baram but instead a small animal. The whole logic, if there is any there, is very scattered and it seems Sook and Kim were both very aware of what was going on which then brings up the whole swapping story into question. What we do know as of the date of this upload is that both Sook and Kim have been charged with a slew of charges and both are facing life in prison if convicted of everything. Hopefully more answers will come out and if Kim's baby was placed for adoption, then I truly hope that baby went to a loving family, one that baby Baram deserved to have. and the long arm of the law as well as the federal government are united in the search for the criminals and the restoration of the child to its parents. It is our belief that with this knowledge the kidnappers will soon recognize that their only hope for successful flight and safety lies in my last video i talked about the hall mills case being forgotten about due to a number of reasons one of those being the Lindbergh kidnapping I know that it is a case that most have at least heard of, but when I started looking, I noticed it wasn't as discussed as I originally figured it would be. So I figured that it would be a proper follow-up to the Hall Mills video. The overall story of what occurred with the Lindbergh case has been very well documented, and it was another instance of a crime taking place that took the world by storm. And unlike a lot of my videos, this one is labeled as solved. Yet there were a lot of theories that pointed to who they accused and convicted of the crime was in fact innocent. I also wanted to talk about this because of just how important this case was to law enforcement. Things that are normal for the justice system today are in fact a result of the Lindbergh case. But enough of me rambling, let's jump right into it. This is the true story of the kidnapping of baby Lindbergh. On March 1st, 1932, at around 9 o'clock at night, Charles Lindbergh and his wife Anne were spending the evening relaxing and preparing to go to bed. All seemed normal in the massive two and a half story house that the famous aviator and his family called home. Around 10 p.m., the nursemaid, Betty Gow, made her way to the bedroom of one-year-old Charles Lindbergh Jr. And to her horror, she found the child's bed empty and the window open. She rushed to the window and saw a broken ladder lying on the ground. Betty ran out of the room, yelling for Charles and Anne. The parents rushed back upstairs and into their son's room and quickly began examining it. Seeing that their son wasn't there, while frantic, they continued searching and discovered something that made their stomachs drop. On the windowsill, Charles found a ransom note. Skimming the words and seeing a demand for money, the realization hit him that his son had been kidnapped. Charles and the family butler, Ollie Waitley, quickly made their way outside and searched the grounds. They made their way over to the ground that was below the child's room. There, they found a broken wooden ladder and the blanket belonging to Charles Jr. Staring out into the dark woods that surrounded the Lindbergh home, Charles knew that there was no time to waste. Both he and Ollie made their way back inside, and it was then that Ollie telephoned the police and Charles telephoned his attorney. Shortly after the police were alerted, the Lindbergh house was locked down by authorities as they began to interview Charles and Anne, as well as examining the scene. 
During this initial investigation, several errors had been made, such as countless police officers stepping in the area where the ladder and the blanket were found, and the ransom note was handled by at least five different people barehanded. The window and window sill were also touched by several people as well. A fingerprint examiner arrived on the scene around midnight, but was unable to find any usable fingerprints. The examiner was also unable to find any footprints, even though the bedroom floor contained traces of mud. This led authorities to believe that whoever did this wore some type of cloth or wrapping on their shoes. They also figured that since there were no usable prints on the windowsill or the ransom note, that whoever wrote it wore gloves. The ransom note in question stood out to police due to how poorly it was written. This is what the ransom note said. Dear Sir, have $50,000 ready, $25,000 in $20 bills, $15,000 in $10 bills, and $10,000 in $5 bills. After two to four days, we will inform you where to deliver the money. We warn you for making anything public or for notify the police the child is in good care. Indication for all letters are signature and three holes. The signature the writer was referring to were two blue circles with a red circle in the middle, with three holes punched in them, one in the center of the red circle and the other two on the left and the right of the blue circles. The ransom note was thoroughly examined and it was concluded that it was all written by the same person. As the investigation continued further into the night, the latter was the next focus of the police. They knew that this was obviously how the child was taken, but what stood out was that the ladder was broken. It was as well examined for any kind of fingerprints, but again, none could be found. By the following day, the news of what had happened was hitting the country by storm. Within 24 hours of the kidnapping, the FBI had arrived and assisted the New Jersey police on the case. The thing about this entire event that stands out here is that Charles Lindbergh was a very well-known name throughout the country. He was seen as a hero in aviation, and he was the first person to fly non-stop from New York to Paris solo, completing a 3,600 mile or 5,800 kilometer flight in just over 33 hours. This accomplishment not only made him a household name, but allowed him to rub shoulders with some of the most powerful people in the country. To have an American hero's son kidnapped caused an outcry from the public to solve this case. Police knew the magnitude of what they were dealing with, and it could be that due to Lindbergh's social standing was why Charles himself at many points, especially at the beginning, seemingly led the entire investigation. For the first two months of the investigation, the operating center was actually in the garage at Lindbergh's home. No move was made without Charles knowing, and many of the decisions came down to if Charles approved them or not. And in the following two months, many have debated on if how everything was handled led to the outcome that shook the entire country to its core and led to the public demanding justice for little Lindy. On March 2nd, 1932, the FBI, who at this point was known as the BOI, the Bureau of Investigation, aided the New Jersey Police Department, and while many would think that this would be a good thing, the truth was that the FBI and the local and state authorities didn't see eye to eye on much involved in this case. The FBI would sit on the sidelines for this time, continuing to offer their assistance when requested. On March 6, 1932, another ransom note was delivered, and this time they had increased the ransom from $50,000 to $70,000. The only issue that Charles had with this was not the money at all, but it was the fear that the kidnappers would simply increase the money more and more, and he would never see his son again. Due to Charles being such a major part of the initial investigation, he was able to be at the center of any and all talks on who could be behind the actual crime. The talks of organized crime being responsible was mentioned, and figures like Al Capone actually reached out to Lindbergh, offering aid in helping locate his son in exchange for legal favors because at the time Al Capone was in prison. 
Although they were denied, it goes to show just how big this entire thing was, and how much influence Charles actually had when a notorious gangster was offering to use his power to help him. It was also at this time that the New Jersey police offered a $25,000 reward for the safe return of Charles Lindbergh Jr. And on top of that, Charles himself offered an additional $50,000. This type of money was unheard of in 1932. This was during the Great Depression, and seeing that kind of money up for grabs got the public even more invested into this case. The letters continued coming in from the kidnappers, and while little progress was being made, a figure of hope came forward. He wasn't some high-ranking politician, nor a famous gangster. He was instead a retired school teacher, and his name was John Condon. The story with John Condon is that he offered an additional $1,000 for the safe return of the child. He was also offered to act as a go-between for the kidnappers and for the police. Charles approved of this, as did the kidnappers, and things were finally set in motion to hopefully end this nightmare that the Lindbergh family was living. On March 10, 1932, Condon received the ransom money and began negotiating via newspaper, using a code name known as Jaffsey. On March 12, 1932, somewhat of a scavenger hunt began for Condon. It started around 8.30 that night when Condon was delivered a letter from a taxi driver who was given the letter by a stranger. The letter gave instructions to Condon where he would find the next letter. When he found that letter, he found more instructions on where and when he would meet with someone representing the kidnappers. The meeting place was at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. The meeting was very brief and Condon was unable to get a good look at the man who referred to himself as John. During the meeting, John told Condon that he was part of a gang and that he was Scandinavian. He assured Condon that the baby was safe but would only be returned when the ransom was paid. Naturally, Condon wanted proof that they actually had the child, and John told him that he would give proof by sending him the boy's pajamas. Before the meeting ended, however, the stranger, known as John, asked Condon a question that made his blood run cold. John asked, Would I burn? If, if the package were dead, would I burn? He quickly followed up with this by assuring the child was safe. But Condon and all of those searching for the child now feared that they were quickly running out of time. On March 16th, the child's pajamas were delivered to Condon and given to Charles who confirmed that they were his sons. On March 29th, Betty Gow, the nursemaid who was in the home on the night of the kidnapping, found a thumb guard that was worn by Charles Jr. on the night that he was kidnapped. On March 30th, the kidnappers sent Condon another note, where they were threatening to raise the ransom to $100,000. The relations between Condon and the kidnappers at this point were getting to a breaking point, and many in law enforcement believed that they were stalling. On April 1st, the next letter instructed Condon to have the money ready for the next night. The next night, on the 24th, another letter was given to Condon, and similar to the first night he met John, Condon was given the letter by a taxi driver who said that he was given it by a stranger. This letter instructed Condon on where he would find the next letter, and upon discovering that letter, a time was given on when the meeting would occur. Later that night, Condon again met with John. He handed the bag of money containing $50,000, the original amount, and in turn, John gave Condon another letter. This letter gave instructions on where they could find the child. The letter went on to say that he was on a boat named the Nelly, and that it was near Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. The next day, a large-scale search was made in the Martha's Vineyard area, but unfortunately, neither Charles Jr. nor the Nelly could be found. It was obvious to Condon, Charles, and the police that they had been set up. The location, or even knowing if the child was alive, was now anyone's guess. And it would remain in this state for over a month. That was until May 12, 1932, when the outcome that nobody wanted came true. On 
On May 12, 1932, a truck driver named Orville Wilson and his co-worker, William Allen, were driving near Mount Rose when they stopped on the side of the road due to Allen needing to relieve himself. Upon returning to the truck, Allen froze in his tracks as he saw something sticking out of the leaves. He made his way closer, and to his horror, he discovered the partially buried remains of a baby. Knowing this could very well be who the entire state was looking for, Allen ran back to the truck and the two men quickly alerted authorities. Upon examining the remains, they could quickly tell that the skull was fractured, and they also made note that it appeared to be a quick burial. Identification was made by Betty Gall and Charles Lindbergh. There were also reports that parts of the body were missing, and police assumed that this was due to scavenging animals. The coroner examined the remains, and after an examination, it was ruled that the cause of death was due to a blow to the head, and that Charles Jr. had been deceased for nearly two months. The full attention of this case was now to find whoever was responsible for this horrible crime. On May 13, 1932, a day after the discovery of the body, President Hoover ordered that all government investigative agencies be at the disposal of the New Jersey Police Department. The newspapers were updating the world daily on the progress, and people were helping in any way that they could. And the FBI actually used this to their advantage by getting banks involved. The FBI informed all major city banks in the area of the ransom money and to be on a strict lookout for it. Some of the money given as ransom were actually gold certificates that were soon going to be taken out of circulation. This was done in hopes of the kidnappers spending the money much quicker. It eventually led to most of these banks being given booklets on what exactly the serial numbers were. As time went on and little progress was being made, this extended past banks and eventually gas stations, grocery stores, airports, department stores, post offices, and even insurance companies were all given these same booklets on what the serial numbers were. The net that the FBI was casting was growing bigger and bigger by the week, to a point that things from the scene of the crime were being re-examined and some new information actually came forward from this. Investigators concluded that the ransom note was obviously written by someone who didn't speak English fluently, and they went even deeper and speculated that the writer was German. They then focused their attention on the ladder used. Upon re-examining it, it was found to have been poorly built, but that it was built by someone who had some skill in woodworking, and that they were possibly mechanically inclined. They went even further by hiring an expert in wood, a man by the name of Arthur Kohler, who actually took various pieces of the ladder apart and examined them, and he was able to trace some of the wood back to nearby factories. This, however, will come back into play later in the video. While physical evidence was being examined, the FBI was also closely monitoring the ransom money and the gold certificates. And over the course of several months, they began to see significant progress in this method. On August 20th, 1934, and continuing into the next month, 16 gold certificates were discovered, and most of them centering around the areas of Yorkville and Harlem. As the investigation continued, the method of watching the money paid off, as the circle began to close in. Law enforcement agents were able to get witness statements from those who were given the gold certificates as a form of payment, and as more people were interviewed about who was using them as payment, the description that they would give would continuously match the description that Condon gave when describing John. Granted, Condon never got a perfect look at his face, but he did go on to state that he would never forget his face. So I guess take that how you want. The big break came on September 15, 1934, when a gas station attendant quickly alerted authorities that they were paid with a gold certificate, and that this man had used these same certificates in the prior weeks. The attendant was suspicious of this, as they were made aware of how to spot the ransom money. This led the attendant to write down the license number of the car. When the FBI searched this number, they got a hit, and that it belonged to a man named Bruno Richard Hauptmann. 
On September 18th and into the 19th, federal and local authorities closely monitored Hauptmann's house. On the morning of the 19th, when Bruno was walking to his car, and when he got into the car that matched the license number, he was quickly arrested, and the evidence against Bruno quickly mounted. First, authorities were able to confirm that he was indeed Bruno Richard Hauptmann. He was a German carpenter who had been in the United States for a little over a decade. When searching his wallet, they found a gold certificate that was a part of the ransom money. His house was searched where they found over $13,000 of the ransom money hidden inside of his garage. During the search of his house, Bruno was positively identified by one of the taxi drivers as the man who gave him one of the letters to give to Condon. And speaking of Condon, he as well identified Bruno as the John who he gave the ransom money to and whom he met the first time in the cemetery. The car that Bruno owned was a Dodge sedan that was also positively identified by several people as the car that was seen in the area near the Lindbergh home the day before the kidnapping. The ransom letters were up next. Bruno was made by the police to give handwriting samples and those samples were then closely examined and compared to the ransom letter and the other letters. The findings showed incredible similarities as can be seen in these pictures. The other striking similarity was the sketch done after Condon described what John, or well, Bruno, looked like in the cemetery the night that he met him. And those results are pretty similar as well, in my opinion. With all of this, police felt they had more than enough to indict Bruno for the charges, and on January 3rd, 1935, he was taken to trial. During the trial, a lot of the evidence presented made it very difficult for anybody to reason that Bruno wasn't responsible for the crime. However, Bruno argued that the money wasn't even his and that he was holding it for his brother. Apart from things previously mentioned, what was also brought to light at the trial was that the wood that was used in the construction of the ladder matched exactly with the same wood that was used to build Bruno's attic. The tool marks found on the ladder also perfectly matched with tools owned by Bruno. Condon's phone number and address were found written on a door frame inside of a closet in Bruno's home. And it was confirmed that Bruno's handwriting and the handwriting from the ransom note were a match. With the overwhelming evidence against him, the jury came back with a guilty verdict. And on April 3rd, 1936, Bruno Richard Hauptmann was executed. The reason for why the kidnapping even happened in the first place was assumed to be the most obvious answer, for money. Bruno figured out a way to kidnap the son of a wealthy and famous figure and figured that he would easily get the money. He clearly took the steps and necessary precaution at the start to avoid any detection, and with how careful he was with the letters, it seems he thought about this for some time. And unlike many of my videos, this case, according to the FBI, has been solved and closed. Googling right now who was responsible for this crime will show you a result of Bruno. But of course, that didn't stop the possible theories on if this were in fact a cover-up. And while I do love delving into theories, I did have some hesitations with doing it here. I have seen theories ranging from organized crime being involved as a means of getting leverage on a very influential figure, that it was a robbery gone wrong, that Charles Jr. actually survived and was moved to Germany in secret by very powerful figures, and the most popular theory, that Charles Lindbergh himself was responsible for all of it. This may come as a shock to you given how involved he was with the case, and how he steered a lot of the early direction to where he wanted. But that is exactly why people look at him now with suspicion. I am not personally saying that he had anything to do with what happened, and the reason for that is mostly my own moral views on topics like this. It's really easy to theorize, and it's easy to name people, especially those close to the victim, as suspects. But the problem is, when you only have speculation or circumstantial evidence, then you take a big risk on putting your foot in your mouth. 
Also, just imagine, a tragic case like this happens to you, and then years later, people begin accusing you or speculating that you had something to do with it. So for me, I don't feel comfortable really going down that rabbit hole. The things that I have read as to why people suspect Lindbergh being behind his son's own kidnapping include things like when they first discovered his bedroom empty, Charles announced to his wife, they have stolen our baby, before even searching anywhere else in the house. That Charles was the person to discover the ransom note, even though Anne and Betty Gow were in the room before him. That he turned away the FBI when they offered help that Lindbergh rejected the NYPD's plan to stake out the cemetery. While yes, these do sound suspicious, they can also easily be countered. It could be that he rejected the FBI's help because he didn't believe an outside source could be trusted. He could have rejected the plan by the NYPD because he didn't want to risk any harm coming to his son. Yes, if he were to be the first person to discover a note during a very frantic moment when Anne and Betty hadn't, keep in mind they weren't even looking for a ransom note. They were looking for their child. And if it was reported that Charles yelled, they have stolen our baby, keep in mind that the only proof of this is word of mouth. The reason I have a tough time thinking Charles could have been involved was due to the police presence around him at all times. In that entire time, Nobody else suspected him, until years, if not decades later. And if that were the case, then how did they go about framing Bruno? How did they plant the money on his person? Did they just go to his house and leave the money there, and Bruno just took it? It's just, to me at least, seems people are trying too hard to make things fit. But I am curious as to what all of you think, and I would love to hear about it in the comments because there is a lot to this case. Things that I didn't even mention, because some of them go in a vastly different direction and that I feel go too far into the void of speculation, with no actual proof backing it. As I said in the beginning of this video, this case was a huge moment in the history of the FBI as well, due to the outcome of what happened. Kidnapping a victim and taking them across state lines became a federal crime. A law that still remains, to this day, as a direct outcome from this case. What ultimately is known, without any doubt, is that on March 1st, 1932, Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr. was taken from his bed and into the cold night. What he met with was a tragedy, no child, nor parent should ever have to experience. And we can only hope that in the future, these type of crimes eventually end. I'm actually going to add in a quick last minute edit here. There were some who actually questioned if Bruno really was the person responsible for this crime. It began to get messy when, in the initial investigation, Condon began having retracting statements on if he thought Bruno was the man he met in the cemetery. Yet, I have read other sources where it claimed Condon was sure that Bruno was John. Another instance of confusion was when Charles claimed that when he was with Condon on the second meeting with John, that he heard John's voice, but he said that it would be hard to remember a voice he only heard one time. Yet, Charles also went on to say during trial that he was sure that it was Bruno's voice. There were also allegations of police actually beating Bruno when being questioned. The rumors of witnesses being threatened, evidence tampering, and telling the media blatant lies about Bruno were also subject to intense debate. One of the most damning things about Bruno, though, was Condon's number actually being written inside of a closet inside of Bruno's home. Well, that was actually rumored to have been staged by a journalist. It was never proven that that in fact happened, but it was just another thing that caused some to begin to question Bruno's involvement. The entire topic is actually still debated to this day on his true guilt or innocence. If 
If you have ever watched a horror movie, then you no doubt have been one of those people who have yelled at the TV in annoyance and frustration that the soon-to-be victim is running right into the monster's trap, or that one character is clearly ignoring every possible sign to get out of the house when something obviously isn't right. But for most of us, we are shouting these commands from the comfort of our home, where we know we are safe. Rarely do we ever find ourselves in dangerous situations and react how we think we would. Some will freeze in fear and others will need to know what is happening because not knowing could be far worse. This is exactly the situation that Redditor E. Behringer found himself in when he made a post describing something straight out of a horror movie. The disturbing things I've been finding in my spare room. Hello, and apologies for my quick introduction. I'm scared and confused about what's happening, and I need help. A friend said I should post this here, though I'm a realtor, not a Redditor. I'm desperate for answers, however, and if anybody can help me understand any of this, this is worth explaining my situation publicly. I feel like I'm losing my mind, and I frankly have no idea where to turn for answers. I rent out apartments throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn, occasionally making a decent fee, but I'm honestly not cut out for this business. I see families in need, and I try my best to help them, not shake them down for as much as possible, like many others in this industry. At any rate, I recently moved into a two-bedroom unit to clean it up and live at until next month when I'm signing a year lease for my new space. I've been here for about a week, just getting everything unpacked and trying to get to work on some simple repairs. I won't bore you with the maintenance work. Nothing of note happened until I heard the noises coming from the second bathroom, which is vacant. I bought a queen size bed and frame, but aside from that, the room has been empty. A few nights ago, however, I heard a strange, almost digital rumble, first thinking it to be the upstairs neighbors shifting furniture, but as I rose to perhaps knock on the ceiling lightly, I realized that it was coming from the other room. The second bedroom faces a busy street, so I almost associated the noise to traffic or some poorly scheduled construction. But the closer I walked to the closed door, the more I was positive the sounds were emanating from within. A bit nervous someone had somehow climbed up to the second story, I pulled a kitchen knife from the box of cutlery and approached the door, completely confused by the droning, electric sounding hum. I twisted the knob and kicked the door in, knife raised in defense, and my bewilderment magnified. The windows were all closed and locked, Nobody was in there, and the sound was instantly gone upon cracking the door open. But my stomach jumped to my throat in the grim discovery of what was on the floor. There was a severed thumb, wet blood, on the fleshy pulp protruding from the clean slice. I nearly vomited, backing out as horror flooded my mind. I returned to take a few photos and a video of the thumb, careful not to touch it. Additionally, the storage compartment above the closet door was wide open, though it had been closed when I'd last been in there, and there is absolutely nothing inside, no false panels or false walls. I checked repeatedly after the ordeal. Here's the video I took with my phone. It is a bit graphic. Unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, the video of the thumb has been removed from YouTube. I checked under the bed. I scoured every nook, corner, and cranny, but nothing was in there at all. There were no holes in the wall, windows, ceilings, or floors whatsoever. I called the police and they came by in a drawn-out ordeal of angered neighbors with half a dozen people asking me questions, and after answering all of them, they took the info of the building owner as well as mine and a few neighbors. Eventually, after all of the statements and photos were taken, the sobering experience ended as uniformed officers shuffled down the stairs to head out. 
After thanking me for my cooperation, the remaining detective suggested changing my locks, but I know for a fact nobody came or went. My bedroom is directly next to the apartment entrance near my television and it stays locked and deadbolted. Hours after the police had vacated the apartment, I was still unable to sleep knowing something impossible seemed to have occurred. The next few days were mostly uneventful, but I kept that second bedroom door shut and I kept busy at the office, staying later than usual to limit my time spent at the home that no longer felt like one. I ate meals out, lingered in coffee shops searching for clues or other anomalies of the sort, but finding very little online about anything remotely like my situation. Mainly just thefts gone wrong and fast food nightmares as search results. Last night, I heard it again, and I took my phone out to record it. I approached the growing, peculiar hum from behind the second room's door as unease built in my gut. There was a faint smell. I couldn't quite place it, but it reminded me of summer before I could identify it. The smell of chlorine, or perhaps ozone, was barely distinguishable, faintly lingering in the air. As I approached the bedroom door to that bizarre sound, I opened the door and the sound ceased immediately as it opened, and there on the floor, nearly in the same spot as the thumb, was a cracked cell phone. The cabinet above the closet that leads to absolutely nothing with no false back of any sort once again was open. As anxiety had been fraying my nerves, I rented a hotel to stay the night, but curiosity got the better of me and I plugged in that smashed phone which was drained of battery before taking off. Here's the sound and phone. Today, I returned to the apartment with a queasy feeling, but powered through the process of starting the phone and searching for clues. There were no calls or text, and the very few contacts saved in the list were incomplete numbers, 14344, 12824, 143, etc. There were no photos, but there were two videos, which I watched in revulsion and horror. The first showed some fleshy mass that almost resembled a face devoid of eyes behind transparent plastic, gnashing teeth or moving in frantic burst as that awful sound screamed. The second clip is the second bedroom door opening from the inside aimed towards my room. With my bedroom door open, the most unsettling thing about the second part of that clip is that out of habit I only leave my bedroom door open when I'm there. This was the end of the post made by E. Behringer. As of this upload, he has made no further post on his Reddit account, which gives a very sinister feeling to all of it, knowing that there could have been someone or something living in the apartment. Now, I will go on ahead and say that this could very easily be faked. On top of that, something that did somewhat throw up a red flag for me was that this was posted to r slash no sleep which has a reputation of having good, 
yet fictitious stories all over it. Many creepypasta channels get their material from No Sleep, if that tells you anything. With the lack of any actual conclusion, it is both frustrating, yet creepy, that we never heard anything back from OP after the video of someone clearly in the apartment with him. The creepier part to me was that short clip of what appeared to be a decomposing corpse wrapped in a plastic bag. It actually sent chills down my spine, which doesn't happen often, but that one got me. I did examine it to see if I could tell for any signs of it being fake, but I couldn't find any. Granted, again, this could have easily been faked, but if it's not, and OP did find himself wrapped up with something demonic or a very disturbed person is anyone's guess. I checked out the YouTube channel linked to OP and found that there is no content available to the public and that the videos he did share were marked as unlisted. And with the absence of any social media accounts, it seems that this post will remain, at least for the time being, in this state of unknown limbo. If this was a hoax, then props to OP for making something I found genuinely creepy. But if this wasn't staged, and it was real, then I hope OP was able to get out of that apartment before it was too late. Reddit is a go-to place for many people when it comes to getting something off their chest, needing more information on a particular subject, or wanting the advice of a completely unbiased stranger. I myself have used various communities with getting help on things spanning from computer questions to minuscule things such as video game collectibles. No matter the importance of your question, you have a good chance of either finding the answer to your question or at the very least being pointed in the right direction of finding out what you need to know. This is what user Mutual Butterfly may have thought when she made a post on r slash creepy encounters. I think I found a hidden camera in my friend's bathroom. I'm staying at my friend's house for the weekend to spend time with him while he's back from college. He currently lives with his family, mom, dad, and younger sister. While I was using the bathroom, I looked over to the right and noticed a black square adapter plugged into the wall facing me directly. I looked closer and noticed a black hole in the middle kind of looking like a camera. I don't know if it's exactly a camera or just a small hidden LED light to show if something is charging. I then noticed that it was connected to a cord leading to what looks like a white charging block, but I honestly don't know what it could be. If it's a camera, it caught me staring at it and taking photos, so I'm a bit nervous. Plus, I'm female. It's scary to think someone could be recording me and could be posting it online for some money. I know he's not the type of person to stalk on somebody, but also he hasn't even been home for that long, so I think it might be his father's. I want to bring it up to him and ask about it, but I want to make sure that I'm not overreacting. I have photos of the adapter if anyone is interested in helping. I'll gladly send photos to help. Update 1. Wow, so I was not expecting this much help. Thank all of you so much. I'm currently still here at his house and waiting for my roommate to pick me up to take me home. I currently don't have a car. If I did, I'd be gone by now. But she is aware of the situation and is just as interested as me and scared. I do have one issue. When I woke up to use the bathroom, I passed by his, the father's slash mother's room, and noticed what looks like a frantically thrown around room with cords all over the bed. I may just be overlooking and this could be someone looking for their charger, but again, I felt it was important to say this. To answer some questions, yes, the back of the adapter had a weird set of numbers with power adapter model S3 on top of it. 
When I put those words into Google, it did come up with a recommended search for cameras. So again, I don't know if I'm just overlooking everything simply because I'm paranoid, but if any of you saw that and know what this means, please let me know. Thank you. Another question slash misunderstanding is that it was in the bathroom facing directly to the side of me, but did show the whole shower. Meaning, if this is a camera, it's been recording people taking showers, not just taking shits. Some back info on the family. My friend I've known for a very long time is fully gay, and there's mostly women in this house all the time when my friend isn't here in college. Unless he's snooping on his father, but I really doubt that. But I honestly think it's more likely the father. He does give me weird vibes. And as for the younger sister, I think she's around 15, so if this is a camera, I will be infuriated. Yes, because I was recorded, but the moment I see others were, especially the younger sister, I won't be able to shut my mouth when it comes to confrontation. And yes, the family knew ahead of time I was visiting if this helps. I don't have an Android phone, but my mom does, so I will probably use hers and see if I can detect the camera. Lastly, when I took the adapter, I also took the cords connected to it and the white block connected to the cord. Feel free to message me if you have any more questions. I'll try to update as much as I can, but I've noticed that the thread is locked, which I don't understand. I'm not new to Reddit, but this is the first time I posted something serious. But again, thank you. It means a lot of people care and I will update once I get home. It may take me a while since I'm going to be running errands before going home, but I will update you all in a bit. Update 2. I finally left guys and it's a camera. I took off the sticker on the back of the adapter and there's an SD card. Here's a picture of it. When I popped out the SD card, there's an A written on it. It's 32 gigabytes as well. I'm freaked out. Here's a pic of what it looks like. Unfortunately, much like the same with the first story, the pictures that OP has posted are no longer available. I am freaking out. I told my friend and he is in so much distress. He's scared. I told him everything, including how I posted this on Reddit. Him and his mother want to see what's on it and take it to the police. Update 3. Hey everyone, I'm sorry for the late reply, but I have some important info. So yes, we found proof of it being a camera and saw the footage on the camera with an SD reader that you plug into your phone. I told my friend and he decided to tell his mother to ask on what to do and she was completely distraught. She immediately contacted a friend who happens to be a lawyer for some advice and she advised that we take it to authorities and we are planning to. While browsing the footage, we noticed that it wasn't anything too revealing. And yes, I know it's still illegal to record anyone without their permission or knowledge, but it still helped us deal with everything a bit better. My friend decided to confront his father about it, but he admits a friend from his job loaned it to him a year ago, but quickly quit the company after suing the company after an injury and fleeing the country after receiving his money. Now we are currently trying to find proof that this exchange ever happened. And it could be that this man knowingly gave an older man with a younger daughter and son a hidden camera to capture them and maybe sell them online. Allegedly, in theory, don't come for me. Now for what was on the card was over 70 videos and different amounts of footage and folders. Only one folder had the videos, but there was a WhatsApp folder that was empty, which was weird. A lot of it was black, just showing the candle burning all day, but it did capture people using the bathroom. I will try to keep updating things as I go, but this is a lot to uncover for me. I'm still in denial about this, so I'm just going on my own pace, as well as my friend's family. My friend said that his dad was really upset once he was told that his daughter, wife, and son were possibly recorded. So I don't know. Take that as you will. Now, that is a lot to unpack. But as we have just learned, OP was staying at her friend's house when she came across what she thinks is a camera in the bathroom and that it could have been recording herself and her friend's family members. 
This goes without saying as to why this is highly disturbing, and for myself and many of my friends, is a massive fear when staying at hotels or Airbnbs. I find it even more disturbing that this was at her friend's house, and it just makes the situation feel so much more violating when it comes from people that you trust. OP goes on to explain what the camera looks like, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, the pictures that she links do not work, so I have no way of telling what kind it is. She does go on to describe that the contents from the SD card were not anything too revealing, so I am assuming that she means nobody was recorded showering. OP does make a solid point, however, that being recorded without permission is illegal nonetheless. The entire situation that she has found herself in are the nightmares of many people. Cameras are getting smaller and smaller, and the digital age that we all live in now, it shouldn't come as a shock that cameras can now simply resemble a charging block. Something most all of us see every day and never give a second thought to. When OP goes into more detail and that she knows it couldn't have been her friend and from there eliminating all from suspicion except the father, we get the story that OP's friend's father got the camera from a co-worker who shortly after fled the country. It is presented from the father's point of view that he didn't know it was a camera and simply thought that it was a charging block. And while that could very well be the case, it also is far too suspect to simply accept it without question. For a while after this, OP was doing her best to respond to all of the comments that she was getting on her post, with some telling her that the father seems suspicious, and others telling her that she needs to simply take the camera to the police. OP's reaction to this is what really stands out to me as genuine. Nobody would ever want to be in a situation like this, but given that she was, and on top of that, from people that she knows and trusts, it makes it that much worse. I can see why at the end of her post she said she was going to do this at her own pace, because if it were me, I would not know where to start either. Do you go to the police, or do you simply try to move on and not cause a scene? It could be incredibly conflicting for someone, and I understand why OP needed to process the entire thing. For those who found this post though, they were searching high and low for updates, and even going so far as to branch out past the Creepy Encounters community itself. That was when one user posted on the RBI subreddit and asked, Has there been an update on the girl who may have found a hidden camera in the bathroom of her friend's house? And not long after that, Mutual Butterfly responded, OP here. Hi everyone, I'm so sorry if I worried anyone and I apologize for not updating. I don't usually go on Reddit as much, but the support is overwhelming, so thank you. As for an update, I don't know if they contacted authorities at all regarding the camera. My friend told me that he told his mother and that they contacted a lawyer friend who would help them, but he hasn't told me anything since then but I want to refrain from talking too much about this situation because lawyers are now involved, so I don't want to accidentally say the wrong thing, so I will stick to what I know is true. As for what was on the camera, it was videos of people using the bathroom, his sister and my friend, but black screen audio only videos that didn't record anything worth speaking about. I also want to ask for a bit of respect towards his family. I saw a lot of comments speaking badly about my friend and his father, and I'd just like to say that we don't know who did it. It's okay to have opinions, but please keep them a bit more less mean, please. If you have any questions, please ask. I'll answer as much as I can, and I promise to stay on Reddit all night to answer them. The poster who asked the question on the RBI subreddit followed up with this to OP's response. What exactly was his dad's excuse for the box being plugged into the bathroom, pointed at the toilet and the shower? If you could go into detail about that excuse, I'm sure a lot of us are interested in hearing it. Sure, no problem. So looking back at the text messages, my friend said this exactly. I talked to my father about it and he said that his friend at work let him borrow it over a year ago and he didn't know. I don't know what to believe. I told him that he needs to find out everything possible about the supposed man that lent him the block and my mom wants to go to the police with the camera regardless. 
She also told her lawyer friend, and she's going to help us with the whole process. The thing connected to it was his portable battery that he was charging. After that, he came over to my house to talk to me about it, and he showed me what was on the 32 gigabyte SD card. I also explained to him that when I first found the charger, it had a hidden glass slide that hid the SD card. Basically, in order to access the card, you need to slide it off, press down on the SD card, and it pops out perfectly. I don't remember if I mentioned this in the original post, so forgive me if I didn't. It was a bad time, and I was freaking out. In my opinion, the father is a bit weird, but in no way do I believe he is smart enough to pull something like that. He's very old and not tech savvy at all. My friend must basically do everything for him, and he only speaks Spanish. He doesn't understand any English at all. Christ, my friend must explain to him how to use a phone, so I don't know. I don't think it's possible for him to pull something like this off. And to explain why his bed was frantic and had cords all over his bed, my friend explained that his dad does this all the time. I'm guessing because he probably has a bad memory and can't remember where he placed something. But again, this is my opinion as of right now. My friend hasn't updated me anymore on what's happened. I don't know if they are going to trial or investigating anything, and I'm guessing the lawyer maybe doesn't want that either. I don't know. I'm seeing my friend this weekend, and I could ask him for an update and see. Others then began giving their own input on the matter as well. OP should be aware that people who are normally not tech savvy or lacking in a skill can be extremely motivated to learn a narrow set of skills in order to act out their predatory urges. Also, pedophiles often collaborate, hence the term ring. They share resources, skills, connections, images, videos, and victims. So, it is possible that the colleague exists, but it is a fellow sexual predator in cahoots with her friend's dad or another family member with access to the bathroom. Bottom line is that it is a big coincidence that an innocent person would plug an electrical device into charge in a bathroom. A bedroom or living area would make sense. But a bathroom is not most people's first choice of a charging location. If the family doesn't take this to the police themselves, then OP should seriously consider doing so. OP is a victim of this and a key witness. They do not need their permission or agreement to go to the cops. OP also has a responsibility to other victims and potential victims to ensure that this is reported and stopped. I do not believe the dad got it from a friend at all. It could very well be a possibility that he was given the block. I trust your opinion. You know the family and I don't. But I just hope that you are careful from here on out when visiting. And if you happen to come across something similar again, that you would take it to the authorities yourself. Everything that was coming from these posts was creating more and more suspicion on the father, and more so his supposed co-worker. The fact that this co-worker fled the country shortly after may have a lot to do with this, or nothing at all. I have seen firsthand how easy it is to snowball something to a point where people are taking theories on the matter as fact and not questioning anything else. The fact that OP had been so open with all of those wanting more information speaks a lot about her wanting to get to the bottom of all of this as well. Because to some, this may be something as simple as a creepy old man wanting to spy on people. And as disturbing as that is, it could be something much bigger than anyone expected, at least at first. Going back to what one commenter said, that pedophiles often share their content and use it for trading with others. This could in fact be the case, or it could be the furthest thing from the truth. Unfortunately, the story of Mutual Butterfly ends there. Since the date of this upload, there have been no new posts on the case, and that could be due to what was mentioned by her earlier that lawyers had gotten involved, and knowing how slow the justice system moves, it could very well be likely that this case is still ongoing, and legally OP cannot talk about it anymore. Or it could be that she simply wants to put it behind her and move on. Whatever the case is, I hope for many of you, this is a warning to always be aware of your surroundings. 
especially in new areas. If you get the gut feeling something is wrong or off, then maybe you need to listen to that because you never know. You may not be as alone as you think. r slash ask reddit is one of the largest subreddits on the site and with its over 30 million members it is frequently mentioned in various reddit themed videos ranging from creepy funny unexplainable and everything in between i myself have lost hours getting sucked into the wild and random things people want to know and the discussions that follow there was one post though that I came across last year and I wanted so badly to make an entire video on it, yet there unfortunately wasn't enough information on the matter. It did deliver one hell of a punch though and I felt it would be a solid send off for part one of this series. Years ago, user Larry Gullinger made a post asking people what was the scariest or creepiest thing that ever happened to them. The entries ranged from peeping toms to home invasions, and as bothersome as those were, there was one entry by a since-deleted account that described their regretful decision to stay at a seedy motel and how they almost paid the ultimate price. Years ago, I was on a cross-country trip, solo, to a family reunion. I was supposed to make it to a friend's house, but there was horrible weather. Then, a terrible accident happened just ahead of me, and I was stuck for quite a while. All told, I was five hours behind schedule. I was exhausted, in need of a bathroom, and a shower, so I pulled into a little strip motel off of a back road. It was very small and dirty, but it would work in a pinch. There was a window to the outside where check-in was. The guy there eyed me up and down and asked me if I was traveling alone. I went to hand him my ID and credit card, but he insisted cash only. Red flags were going off at this point, but I scrounged together just enough cash and he tossed me the key. The room was dirty and barely bigger than the bed. The first thing I did was go to the bathroom. Then I flipped the mattress. Dirty, signs of bed bugs, and a moment later, I spied a cockroach. That was it, I was out. I decided I would use the parking space at least and sleep in the back trunk hatch of my SUV. I curled up using my suitcase for a pillow and random clothes for a blanket and fell asleep for about an hour. I woke up aware of someone talking on a phone outside and I glanced out to see the guy from the check-in standing outside. It was now around 3 o'clock in the morning. He finished his call and then walked quietly over to my room, unlocked the door, and walked in. The lights didn't turn on and a minute or two later he came back out, slamming the door behind him and cursing with another guy. I hadn't seen Guy 2 enter, so I still don't know where he came from. They angrily talked for a moment, then check-in Guy walked over to my SUV. I covered up my head quickly with a shirt. After he tried the locked door, he peered inside the back seat, but between my tinted windows and blending into the general mess, he didn't notice me in the hatch. The two guys walked away to the far side of the lot. Talking more, one of them began gesturing across the street where a diner was. While they were distracted, I climbed up to the front seat and started up the SUV. They turned around in surprise as I pulled away. I called my friends back home and told them, but didn't want to worry my family, so I said nothing to them. When I got back home some three weeks later, we figured out the name of the hotel thanks to Google Maps and called the local police. They told me the place had closed only days before I called. Edit. This was about a decade ago, 
took place along 250, I believe in Virginia. The place was named Mountaintop or Mountainside Motel. It was a single short building, check-in window was in the middle, there was a tiny diner across the street, and there were no other businesses nearby. My logic was that it was smarter than parking by the side of the road. Police took my info, but they never called me back, and I never found out anything from web searches immediately afterwards. And at least one friend thought I misunderstood the situation and that there was a logical reason. It goes without saying that whoever that poster was, that she escaped with her life. And I don't even want to imagine what those two men had planned. What chilled me the most was the second man coming out of the room. Hell, even now as I'm saying this, I'm getting chills from it. Friends, if you ever find yourself in a situation where a seedy motel is your best choice of sleeping, then I urge you to instead find a well-lit rest area, sleep in your car with the doors locked and the engine running. Don't make the same mistake that this poster did, because you may not be as lucky. Spring break is a time that many of us have fond memories of. For most of us, it's a glorious week of no parents, no curfews, and no supervision. It's the first taste of freedom and independence. With the thrill of finishing high school behind us and the excitement of moving on to the next chapter in our lives, spring break is where we find ourselves in that sweet spot of life, where we feel invincible. Mark Kilroy was no different. When, in 1989, he and several of his friends, Bill Huddleston, Bradley Moore, and Brent Martin, made their way to South Padre Island, a hotspot for many spring breakers. The small area is where the southern tip of Texas meets the Gulf of Mexico. As Mark and his friends spent their break drinking, partying, and meeting girls, things seemed to be going normal in terms of the wild nature that spring break is known for. However, for Mark and his friends, something would soon happen that would make the area go from party central to a ghost town in a matter of days. The incident occurred on March 14, 1989, when the group of Mark, Bill, Bradley, and Brent spent the day at Matamoros. They had parked their car on the other side of the bridge and like thousands of other tourists had made their way from the so-called American side to the Mexican side for the festivities. The area was flooded with over 15,000 people that night, and the bars and restaurants in that area were full to the brim with tourists, all wanting to enjoy the lax drinking laws in Mexico. As the night went on, the group bar hopped and chatted with a group of women from the University of Kansas. The night began to end around 2 a.m. when the group decided to make their way back to Brownsville, where they had parked their car. However, due to the large number of people all making their way back across the bridge, it became very difficult for Mark and his friends to stick together. Not shockingly, they got separated, but were able to break into groups of two. Mark and Bill stuck to the side of the street, while Bradley and Brent were somewhere in the middle. It was said that Bradley and Brent were the first to cross the bridge and started hanging out around the car. At the same time, Mark and Bill were trying to navigate the crowd. Bill told Mark that he needed to use the restroom and ran into an alley to relieve himself. In the short time that it took for Bill to return to the street, Mark was nowhere to be seen. Bill, assuming Mark had simply went on ahead without him, continued following the crowd and eventually made his way across the bridge. When Bill regrouped with Bradley and Brent, they were surprised that Mark was nowhere to be found. They waited around for him as they had assumed that he had gotten stuck in the slow moving crowd, but after a while of waiting, they decided to go back to the hotel and figured Mark had simply gone home with someone else that night. Yet when Bill, Bradley, and Brent awoke the next morning and saw no signs of Mark, concern began to grow, and by the afternoon with still no idea where he could be, that concern grew into panic and the group alerted police of Mark's disappearance. At the time, police figured it was simply just another college student that had gotten too drunk and was passed out somewhere on the beach. 
But when no sign of Mark would surface even days later, the whispers of a few concerned friends would quickly grow into having national spotlight aimed directly at finding those responsible. What began as a routine search for a missing person at spring break quickly turned into politicians from both the United States and Mexico working together to find Mark Kilroy. Mark's parents flew in to Matamoros to aid in searching for their son and offered a $15,000 reward for his return. What hindered the investigation from the start was the overall statistic of missing persons in that area. In the first three months alone in 1989, Mark was one of 60 other people who had been reported as missing. With Mark being an American, it was highly probable to authorities that he had been robbed and that foul play could have followed. The levels of drug-related violence were very high in that area, and seeing that Mark was clearly a tourist, it made him a very easy target. Although both the Mexican and U.S. authorities were working together to solve the case, little progress was being made. It got so bad that Mark's friends, Bill, Bradley, and Brent, were put under hypnosis to see if they could jog a memory from the night of the disappearance. And surprisingly, Bradley, while under hypnosis, recalled that he saw a man talking to Mark shortly before he disappeared. Bradley went on to describe a Hispanic man with a scar across his face. He also recalled that the stranger asked Mark, Hey, don't I know you from somewhere? Even with this, little progress was made in identifying any suspect, and Mark's friends all admitted that they couldn't recall the exact time Mark went missing, as they were all intoxicated. Police continued searching the area and assumed that Mark had been killed and dumped somewhere, since in the following days since Mark's disappearance, there had been no ransom made. Even though the situation looked grim, Mark's friends and family refused to give up on the search. Mark's story was also featured on America's Most Wanted in an attempt to stir up some leads and while some were brought forward, none of them panned out. And police quickly found themselves going in circles. After all, they were looking for someone who vanished in a crowd of thousands of people. I have used this saying before, but I feel it fits here more than any other time. But finding an American tourist while on spring break with over 15,000 American tourists doing the exact same thing is essentially like finding a needle in a stack of needles. Yet, hope seemed to come from an incredibly unlikely source that police had no idea would connect back to the missing American. It happened on April 1st, 1989, when police witnessed a car speed through a roadblock and go towards the direction of Matamoros. Police followed the car from a distance and saw that it headed towards a ranch, and after about 30 minutes, the car then left, speeding away. After more surveillance of the car and the area, police were able to identify the driver of the car as Serafin Hernandez Garcia. On April 9th, 1989, after several days of surveillance, police arrested Serafin as well as several others at the ranch. Those arrested included known cult members Davis Serena Valdez and Sergio Martinez. After the arrest, everyone was individually interrogated and that was when Serafin dropped a bombshell that nobody was expecting. He confessed that numerous people had been killed at the ranch, with several of them being sacrificed and that one of them was Mark Kilroy. This was backed up by the caretaker of the ranch, Domingo Reyes, who admitted seeing Mark and that he had been held in one of the outdoor sheds. Armed with this knowledge, police increased the pressure on Serafin and demanded to know more. Serafin eventually told police that the abduction and killing of Mark had been ordered by Adolfo Constanzo, a violent cult leader who was also running a drug gang. According to Serafin, Adolfo ordered him to find a white male or gringo to sacrifice as he believed that it would grant both himself and his followers blessings in the form of safety from rival gangs and police. As Serafin continued telling his story, he recounted the night of Mark's abduction. He stated that he led Mark to an alley and once there, he and two other men forced Mark into the back of a van and sped off. The van stopped a few blocks away and Mark actually broke free and attempted fleeing. He was intercepted by more gang members following behind with another car and at gunpoint forced him back into the back of the van. 
This led Mark to then being restrained. They took the van outside of city limits and into an industrial area. The following day, Adolfo showed up and examined him, seeing that he was a subject that they were looking for. They took him to the ranch and throughout the rest of the day, Mark was continuously assaulted until that night when he was taken to the outskirts of the ranch and forced to get on his knees. At that moment, with his hands and face wrapped in thick duct tape, Mark pleaded with his abductors to let him go. And while others sat in silence, listening to the young man cry for help, Adolfo grabbed a machete and struck the back of Mark's neck with it followed by repeated blows to the back of his head. Mark was then buried, but not before cult members ordered by Adolfo removed his brain and had several of his limbs cut off. Shocked by this, the police demanded to be taken to where they buried Mark. Seraphin agreed and took them to the ranch. The spot where Mark was buried was easy to spot since there were several pieces of wire sticking from the ground. Seraphin told police this was to keep the bones intact so that they could wear them as a means of protection. Having the truth now directly in front of them and realizing that as evil and twisted as Seraphin's story was, it was all true. Shortly after the discovery of Mark's body, police from both Mexico and the United States went hard on the suspects, including Seraphin and the other gang members. This included broadcasting them to over 250 international journalists and showing how each cult member had tattoos and scars all over their body. The authorities knew that they had to go at this entire crime very hard due to it one, being an American tourist who was murdered in another country, and two, due to the violent and graphic way Mark Kilroy met his end. This case actually got so big that the then president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, met with Mark's parents. The green light was on for Adolfo. Mexican authorities went in hard on the entire cult. They burned down the entire ranch and had it recorded on national television, knowing that this would anger Adolfo and hopefully push him out of hiding. And the trick did work in certain ways. Adolfo was said to have exploded in a fit of rage after seeing the ranch torched to the ground. Police didn't stop there and went after every cult member and their family as well, arresting numerous family members with some of them only being guilty of being related to a cult member. Adolfo's mother, who lived in Miami, had her house watched 24-7 in the following weeks. Police finally got their big break from the countless hours of surveillance when on May 6, 1989, while searching around Caltamoc, an area that had links back to Adolfo, police saw a man buying groceries and paying for them with U.S. currency. They followed him back to an apartment, and after deducing that it was one of Adolfo's trusted associates, a man by the name of De Leon. As they prepared the raid on the apartment, Adolfo saw the police and immediately opened fire on them. Adolfo also threw money out of a window to get people to get in the line of fire and force police to stop shooting. After a 30-minute firefight, Adolfo was out of ammunition and knew that he was cornered. That was when he ordered De Leon to shoot him because he wasn't going to get arrested for what he did. De Leon was said to have hesitated at first, but then after being demanded by Adolfo and told that if he didn't, he would suffer in the afterlife, De Leon opened fire on Adolfo and a few seconds later, he was dead. When police stormed the apartment, they found it filled with smoke as Adolfo was attempting to burn the money that he had and once the literal smoke had cleared, they found the lifeless body of the man many claimed to be one of the most evil men in Mexico. The crimes of Adolfo Constanzo were the inspiration for the 2007 horror film Borderland where in the film, three college grads from Texas go to Mexico for vacation and find themselves wrapped up in a cult-like gang that goes on to make the lives of everyone around them a nightmare. While not being a carbon copy or retelling of the crimes that occurred with Adolfo, it shows how big the dark legacy of the man that many in his gang saw as a god could go. Even to this day, the name Adolfo Constanzo is not talked about in certain parts of Mexico due to the very nature of what happened in 1989.
There has often been a debate on whether a person is born bad. This has been a popular topic amongst those in true crime for years, and looking back on certain individuals who committed heinous acts even from an early age and did nothing but increase the violence as they got older. It makes many wonder if some people are simply born to be evil. As criminal justice has expanded its knowledge, there have been beneficial things that have come from that. Understanding a criminal's behavior, or notable triggers for them, and how they as children started with minor offenses and worked their way up to more serious crimes. There have been studies on if people who do such things at such a young age are the product of a serious head injury or an unstable home life. Yet, there have been others who are seemingly brought up in a healthy environment and still choose to do acts of evil. The entire reason I am even bringing this up is due to the person I am about to discuss. That man is Werner Niesick and is seen by many as the most dangerous man in Austrian history. Werner Niesick was born in 1946 in Salzburg, Austria and from a young age was known to have had a bad temper as well as not being afraid to use physical violence on those close to him. Warner started showing these signs by stealing, skipping school, running away from home, and bullying others. For much of his childhood, he was a problem for his mother who was raising him by herself. Warner had never met his real father and only knew his mother as the only family that he ever had which may explain why when she told him that he needed to move out and find his own place, that he lashed out and instead of simply screaming and slamming doors, he instead grabbed a knife and stabbed her in a violent outburst. After this, he stole money from her purse and fled to Germany. Attempting to lay low and find work there, he was quickly arrested by police and sent back to Austria, where he spent the next two years inside of a juvenile detention center for the attack on his mother. Hoping that the time in juvie would help him, many in the detention center kept an eye on him, and when he was released in 1973, it had seemed that he had turned a corner and was in a better place. Yet, they couldn't have been further from the truth. Not long after his release, Warner broke into several homes and businesses and shot an elderly woman during an attempted robbery. He was once again arrested and this time, Warner pleaded that he was insane. He was sentenced to only eight years in prison and by 1980, he was set to be released early. In the weeks before his release, he was allowed three days out of prison to search for work. And as it may come as a surprise to no one, Warner fell back instantly into his old ways. He had managed to save some money while in prison and used that to purchase a gun. He then took a taxi to St. Poulton. Warner then began looking for homes in the area to break into, and that was when he came across the home owned by the Altrima family. Thinking that it was empty, Werner made his way inside and quickly came face to face with 26-year-old Walter Altrima. Walter, who was in a wheelchair, was quickly overwhelmed by Werner and shortly after restraining him, Walter's mother, 55-year-old Gertrude, and his sister, 24-year-old Ingrid, arrived home. Werner managed to as well subdue both women and then he had the entire family at his mercy. Gertrude begged Werner to not harm them and even offered him 20,000 shillings to persuade him to leave. Instead of taking the money and running, which was originally his intended reason to break into the home, Werner instead began to, for the next several hours, beat and defile the family. After 12 hours of crying, screaming, and experiencing true evil, Walter, Gertrude, and Ingrid lay dead in their home. And Werner Niesick, instead of escaping quickly out of the house, was said to have slept next to their bodies after. When Werner finally did leave, he put the bodies of all three family members in the trunk of their car, a brown Mercedes Benz, and showing how cold and ruthless Werner Niesick was, he used the check that Gertrude had made out during her initial plea for mercy to buy dinner. As the bodies of Gertrude, Walter, and Ingrid lay in the trunk of their car, Walter was enjoying a nice dinner. However, eating at this restaurant he picked was Warner's downfall, as one of the employees knew the car and when they saw Warner getting into it and leaving, they immediately alerted police. 
When police went to the home belonging to Gertrude, Walter, and Ingrid, they found the home had been ransacked and knew something was wrong. An APB was put out for the car, and later that evening, a policeman found the car and located Werner getting out of it. Werner was able to be arrested, and when the trunk was open, the bodies were discovered. Werner confessed to the crime and chillingly told detectives that he did what he did for nothing more than the need to kill. He didn't care who it was, he simply needed to. An even more twisted thing that Werner informed detectives of was when he was assaulting Gertrude, he stopped what he was doing and forced her to take her heart medication so that he could continue the assault and enjoyment he got from it. Werner Niesick was sentenced to life in prison. The crimes of Werner were so atrocious that many in the judicial system called for a reform in how criminals like Werner were handled, stressing the importance of scientific and medical studies in prison and how repeat offenders were handled when faced with possible parole or early release. One judge even stated that had Werner been charged with all of the crimes in the early 70s, then he would have never had the chance to harm anyone on the outside, given his record. In 1983, Werner had actually attempted to make a prison escape, but was captured, thankfully. Also, in that same year, the 1983 film Angst was released that depicted Werner's crimes. The film was very closely based on the crimes against the Altrima family going as far as one scene showing the killer giving the mother her medication and ending with him getting caught in their vehicle. Warner Nisik is one of the examples that almost needs to be mentioned when the discussion of are people born bad occurs. But what do all of you think? Was Warner Nisik truly born to be evil or was he just a product of an unstable childhood? The story of Juliet Holm and Pauline Parker was one that had the country of New Zealand not knowing which outcome would be considered a victory for the justice system. The crime that was committed by the two young women was a massive media spectacle and had people arguing on topics such as mental health, homosexuality, and if Juliet and Pauline were even sane enough to stand trial. Yet, the two girls were not a pair of bloodthirsty, rampaging killers. They weren't the frothing-at-the-mouth psychos that some media depicted them as either. Instead, as many saw them, they were misunderstood girls who, acting on emotion, committed a crime that would not only follow them for the rest of their lives, but be an example of how a close friendship can turn into a deadly obsession. Juliet Holm and Pauline Parker were both born in 1938. Juliet and Pauline met in school and quickly formed a very close friendship. As many kids do at a young age, their friendship was seen by both families as a good thing, at least at the start. I'm sure most of us remember our first best friend and how quickly we would become attached to the hip with them. Pauline and Juliet were no different and the pair found themselves bonding over something that they at one point thought of as something that caused them to ironically not have any friends. What the pair bonded over was sickness. Both girls suffered with debilitating illnesses. Pauline had osteomyelitis, an infection that causes inflammation in the bones and in certain cases requires amputation if it gets bad enough. Juliet had tuberculosis, a highly infectious disease that at one point was called the White Death due to its high mortality rate. Luckily for Juliet, a vaccine had been available since 1921, so while she could still get it and be in a sickly state, it wasn't a death sentence as it had been for so many others. With both girls being frequently sick, they found that their bond became even stronger as they felt their friendship was destined to happen. Both being the same age, feeling somewhat as outcast, and both having health issues, it seemed to young Juliet and Pauline that this friendship was different from any other. One thing that both girls loved doing was reading. 
they would take this further and create fantasy worlds together in which they were able to do whatever they wanted. In fact, they didn't seem to mind that they were sick, as they later said they romanticized the idea of being sick together. Because they were both struggling with their health, they could rely on each other to not only understand what they were going through, but also help build their fantasy world. It didn't stop at just fantasizing about their own world. The two girls would write sonnets, plays, books, and even songs about their fantasy life together. It was around this point that the parents of Juliet and Pauline became somewhat concerned as it seemed the two girls had become obsessed with each other. It got to a point that when they couldn't see each other, the other would seemingly get sick. There was one instance where Pauline went on vacation without Juliet and Juliet stayed in bed the entire time and actually became ill. It was said that she cried every night and begged her parents to bring Pauline back. Pauline and Juliet's parents became concerned at this point that the two were forming more than just a friendship and worried that they were developing a homosexual relationship. In 1954, when this was happening, many saw this as a serious mental illness and were scared both girls were going to face legal trouble if it had continued. Regardless of their concerns, the families continued to let the girls stay close, and they seemed to increase the realism of their fantasy world, going so far as to make their own religion and even their own language. The religion that the two made had differing opinions on topics like morality and science. They claimed that their fantasy world could be accessed at any time by them, as it was in a parallel dimension. They went on to call their world the Fourth World and that it only existed due to the power of their friendship. At this point, the family still had concerns and began to wonder if their friendship was healthy, since both girls seemed to have a need for each other. Hoping to create some distance between the girls in a healthy way, one summer Pauline went on vacation and the family didn't take Juliet with them. The outcome was what both parents thought that it would be, and this led to the parents being at a loss for what to do with the girls. Before they could figure out any kind of solution, however, fate seemed to have made that decision for them. Juliet's parents separated due to her mother carrying out an affair, and at the same time Juliet's father was let go from his job and this was going to force them to relocate. Juliet was going to be sent to live with another family member in South Africa, and for Juliet and Pauline, this news was devastating and there was the real possibility that they would never see each other again. The two decided to form a last minute plan and were going to see if Pauline could simply go to South Africa with Juliet. But the only problem they had was that Pauline knew that her mother would never allow it. And the two saw this as the only obstacle in their way. Because of this, Juliet and Pauline's plan was to kill Pauline's mother so that way nobody could say no to her moving away with Juliet. While the three were walking in an isolated path, both girls, who had put bricks inside of a stocking, began violently beating Pauline's mother, Honora Reaper, with them. After several minutes and seeing that Honora was no longer moving, the two girls ran back to the start of the trail to get help. The first people that they saw were a couple by the name of Agnes and Kenneth Ritchie. Pauline and Juliet said that Pauline's mother had fallen and hit her head on some rocks and that she was bleeding. Upon discovering her body, the couple alerted the police and once they arrived, they examined the scene. They saw the vicious lacerations on Honora's face and soon after found the stockings that contained the bricks. Once the two girls were questioned, their story quickly began to fall apart, and it became obvious, especially after interviewing the family, that Pauline and Juliet were responsible for this horrible crime. When the trial occurred, it was a media circus, as people couldn't believe a 15 and 16 year old were capable of such a violent attack. The arguments that they were in love, that they were lesbians, that they believed in witchcraft, were all thrown around, with the fantasy writings the girls had made being used as evidence that they were not sane. 
It painted a picture that these two girls were so obsessed with each other that nothing could tear them apart. And if something tried to, then they would go to extreme measures to make that not happen. Due to their ages, neither Pauline nor Juliet could be sentenced to the type of punishment someone considered an adult would face. Both ended up spending only five years in prison, and once released, it was rumored that one of their parole requirements were to never contact each other again. However, those who worked the trial stated that this was not true, although the families of each girl made it impossible for them to ever see each other, let alone contact each other in the future. Once she was released, Pauline had her name changed to Hilary Nathan and continued to live in New Zealand. Juliet had hers changed to Anne Perry. From what is known, both Juliet and Pauline haven't contacted each other since their release. Pauline particularly has never spoken to the media, but did express through her sister that she has tremendous guilt and regret for what happened and realized how wrong she was for what she had done. From what I could find out, Pauline lives a rather quiet life and has become a very religious person. Juliet moved to England and has actually become a successful author with over 30 books credited to her. She has stated remorse for what she did back when she was 16, but that she has moved on with her life. She did go on to say that the relationship she had with Pauline was purely friendship. And while yes, it was obsessive at times, it was never anything past a platonic friendship. There are many who know of this case and say that the two girls got away with murder. That due to their age, they were given a very easy treatment and have been able to live their lives how they want with little action ever being done about it. The entire story was so talked about that much like the fantasy world Pauline and Juliet made where they created songs and poems about what they imagined, novels, plays, and movies have all been made portraying their crime. One such movie was made in 1994 by Peter Jackson and it starred Kate Winslet as Juliet and Melanie Linsky as Pauline. One thing I can say about this story is that ironically, Pauline and Juliet got exactly what they wanted, that what they did accomplished their goal, that when it comes to one of them, you can't not include the other. So the fantasy world they created for themselves as teenagers, where they would always be together and nothing could pull them apart, in a way, they did exactly that. In the 1920s, America was a hotbed of cultural, societal, and political topics. The country, fresh out of the First World War, was experiencing an economic boom, prohibition was in full swing, and Babe Ruth was the hero of every boy aged 7 to 12. The 1920s also included one of the first known examples of a crime taking place that took the entire country, and eventually much of the world, by storm. On September 14, 1922, in Somerset, New Jersey, Raymond Schneider and his girlfriend, Pearl Bamer, were walking on a quiet road that acted as a lover's lane, when they noticed two people lying on their backs. From what they could tell, one was a man and the other a woman. The man had a hat covering his face and the woman had her head lying on the man's arm. As Raymond got closer to make sure that they were okay, he quickly stepped back in horror and grabbed Pearl's arm, and both of them fled the scene. They made their way to the nearest house they could find and told the owners to call the police. What was known at this moment was that the couple lying on the ground were dead. What wasn't known is that this crime would go on to be labeled by many as the crime of the century. As police arrived at the scene, they were able to tell almost immediately that both the man and the woman were deceased. The identities of the victims were able to be made rather quickly, especially for the man, as his business card was found just below his feet. 
The man was 41-year-old Edward Wheeler Hall, a priest and husband of Francis Hall. The woman was 34-year-old Eleanor Reinhardt Mills, a member of Edward's choir and the wife of James Mills. To police, it was very apparent what this meant as the two were found slain together. But what confirmed that this was indeed an affair was that surrounding the bodies were torn up love letters between both Edward and Eleanor. As police began to study the scene more, they were able to see the brutal extent of what happened to the lovers. Edward was shot once in the head. Eleanor received far worse treatment as she was shot three times in the head and also had her throat cut and her tongue had been cut out. The bodies were positioned after death in a very bizarre way, a striking difference in the violence that both of them had just suffered. Edward was found to be on his back with his hand touching Eleanor's neck. His Panama hat was covering his face and as stated earlier, his business card was found just below his feet. He was still wearing his glasses. He had bruises to both his ear and two of his fingers. His watch was missing, yet there was money left on his person inside of his jacket pocket. He was also said to be very nicely dressed. Eleanor was lying next to Edward, with her head on his arm and her left hand resting on his thigh. She also had a small cut on her bottom lip and her arm also had bruising on it. She was wearing a blue dress, black stockings, and brown shoes. The bodies appear to have been positioned this way post-mortem, and the way that they were lying on the ground, their feet were facing towards a crab apple tree. As police continued studying the scene, the gossip of what had occurred had made its way around town, and people began to flock to the area. Within what seemed like minutes after the first group of people arrived at the scene, hundreds more followed all wanting to catch a glimpse of the bodies and see if the talk was true that if it was indeed the priest and a member of his choir. The overwhelming amount of people quickly got out of control and police were unable to secure the area. It was so bad in fact that much of the physical evidence at the scene was horribly compromised. One example was the business card of Edwards. That card was actually passed around to all of the people at the scene, and no less than 100 different people touched it barehanded. On top of that, there were actually people bringing shovels and digging up the dirt around the scene and the tree, and then selling the dirt in bags to curious onlookers. The tree itself was also nearly destroyed, as many of its limbs and even the bark were ripped off and taken as souvenirs by the crowd. There were reports that some tried taking parts of the love letters, but thankfully at that point, police had managed to get some type of control over the scene, and onlookers watched on still, but now from a distance. Shockingly, even with much of the evidence completely compromised, the lead detective of the case, Joseph Sticker, was said to have not been worried about the case and told reporters that it would be solved in only a matter of days. This, whether it was simply arrogance or the lack of any actual leads, caused the case to stall, and two months after the crime, the identity of whoever was responsible was still unknown. No new leads had been found, and the growing public's demand for answers and justice was getting more and more louder by the day. After months of no progress being made on the case, talks and rumors began to fill the void for the lack of any actual answers. People wondered who was responsible and if the whispers of it being Edward's wife who was behind the whole thing. Seeing as how Edward and Eleanor were having an affair, it's not hard to imagine why they met with such a grisly fate. Given the fact that Edward was a priest and Eleanor being in his choir only made for more gossip as people were being drawn in more and more into the mystery. To many, at the same time, it wasn't shocking that the two were having an affair, as it was somewhat of an open secret that the two didn't go out of their way to hide, at times even being seen in town with each other acting as a romantic couple. Yet most of the town didn't bother voicing their opinions to the couple, as it was more common back then to stay out of others' personal business. Another thing that made this case so publicized and talked about was due to the standing of Edward's wife, Frances. She was the only daughter of one of the most powerful and prominent families in New Brunswick. 
And not only that, but she herself was one of, if not the most well-known member of town. It was no secret that both herself and her family had no shortage of wealth and power. Combine that with her being the one cheated on, and right there are two of the most powerful things one would need when it comes to committing a crime, money and motive. Investigators weren't blind to this either. Over the months of investigating, they had been keeping a close watch on Frances, knowing that she had the means to get what she wanted, regardless of the cost. The police also looked at Eleanor's husband, Jimmy Mills. However, he was quickly dismissed as he was known around the area as somewhat of a pushover. While we now know that that doesn't necessarily mean he is incapable of committing such a crime, to many, including the police at the time, it did. But all the police had was speculation. Sure, Francis obviously had the motive to commit this crime, yet there was no evidence linking her to it. There also were no witnesses for that fact. At least, that is what many thought, until a woman came forward claiming that she knew who was responsible for the crime. Yet, by the end of her story, the amount of doubt surrounding all of those involved in this case did nothing but increase. The witness that eventually came forward was Jane Gibson. She was a pig farmer who lived on and owned the land where Edward and Eleanor were found. She claimed that on the night of the crime, she heard a dog barking and when investigating out of her window, she saw a man walking out from her cornfield. She quickly left her house and followed the man. From a distance, she stayed to the shadows and then began hearing voices arguing. She was able to make out some figures near a clearing, and suddenly she heard a gunshot. Scared, Jane began making her way back to her house, and as she did, she heard several more gunshots. Now that, on the surface, sounds like a very crucial witness statement. While true, she couldn't identify anyone, she could at least give somewhat of a timeline on the crime itself. There is a problem with Jane Gibson, though or, well, problems with Jane Gibson. For one, she seemed to love the press's attention. It was reported that every single time she talked to a reporter, her story became more and more embellished. Another problem was every revision or update to her story seemed to correlate with the new facts coming out about the case from the newspaper. And speaking of the newspapers, they absolutely ate up every single word that Jane was saying. They painted her as a shy country woman who was the only witness to this brutal crime. She in turn kept up with the interviews and statements. There were also several times where she was flat out contradicting herself, and any time that was brought up, she would either ignore the comment completely or blame it on her being sick and weak. Another hole in Jane's story was when her own daughter actually came forward and said that she was a habitual liar. One of the things that stood out the most though and something even I find surprising was Jane herself didn't even point out anything about Frances until long after the newspapers had mentioned her possible involvement. Why I find this surprising is that it seems somewhat obvious to look at Frances. Granted, I get this was almost a century ago and how people view crimes now wasn't the same as it was back then, but I still feel that the light bulb to name Frances could have gone off a lot earlier for Jane. When Jane did finally name Francis as the one that she saw that night in the field, police and the media felt they finally had something that was enough to go to trial. Or rather, I should say trials. The first trial brought against Francis was in November of 1922, only lasting five days. With no physical evidence, only one witness that had repeatedly changed her story, and the social class standing of Francis Hall led to no indictment being issued and Frances Hall was released. She quickly left for Europe after to avoid the media attention and investigators were back at square one. The case remaining unsolved and no new leads coming forward and it would stay in this state for another four years. But try as she might with leaving the country, 
It seemed that the ghost of her late husband wasn't quite done with Francis just yet. As the years passed, the talks of what happened with the Hall Mills case became less and less. The public interest went elsewhere, and it seemed destined to stay in the state of unknown limbo forever. Yet, to one newspaper company, the story was far from over, and there was plenty of material that could be worked with to get the public talking about the case again. For William Hurst, the owner of the Daily Mirror newspaper, where much of the public saw no evidence and an overwhelming number of theories and gossip, Hurst saw dollar signs. In the 1920s, the surge of what is now known as tabloid journalism was becoming a common means of how people got their daily events. The whole media circus that surrounds the form are still seen to this day, where speculation and drama fill in a majority of a story regardless of if it's truthful or not. Hearst decided to bring back the story of the Hall Mill murders and put them front page, not only reigniting the public's interest, but pushing it so much that it eventually would get the police to take notice. One of the biggest things that the Daily Mirror banked on was the testimony from the husband of one of the servants that worked under Francis. It was reported that Francis had actually bribed the servant to not speak about the actions and whereabouts of Edward on the night of the crime. This worked so well that not only did the police eventually take notice, but it was becoming such a big deal again that the then governor of New Jersey, Harry Moore, decided to reopen the case. This time, the trial would be even more media-focused, and the amount of attention that it was getting every single day was unlike anything the public had ever seen. There are even some who argue that this is where the term, the crime of the century, was originally dubbed. In August of 1926, just shy of four years since the crime, Frances Hall and her brother, Willie Stevens, were put on trial for the crimes against Edward Hall and Eleanor Mills. As the trial began, the courtroom became somewhat of a fiasco, as many accusations were made against Frances and Willie. The witnesses that were brought forward during the trial played into a big part of why the entire thing started to fall apart. One by one, every witness was removed from the stand as they were being discredited at every turn, and most of them, if not all of them, were for good reasons. Some witnesses failed basic questioning when asked about the crime. Others had their answers go from definites to possiblies to them finally admitting that they didn't know. And there were even a handful who were later discovered to have been paid by the Daily Mirror to claim to be a witness. At every turn, the prosecution was realizing that there was very little hope in sealing a conviction, so they decided to play an old card of theirs from the first trial. They decided to bring back Jane Gibson and brand her once again as a star witness. The only problem was that this time, whether it was due to her actual health or from the embarrassment from the first trial, she wanted no part in this one and refused to go. There was a lot of back and forth but eventually, Jane did agree to come, but due to her failing health, she had to remain in bed to do so. So, believe it or not, they actually brought Jane from her home and into the court and had her testify and give her statement again, only this time in a hospital bed. Yes, you did hear that right. They physically had her in a hospital bed in the courtroom. But it seems that Jane was still not one to shy away from the spotlight, as when giving her testimony, she again accused Francis of the crime and then reportedly fainted in a very dramatic style. She then had to be brought back into consciousness to then be questioned by the defense. And the defense did not go easy on her. They flat out accused her of lying and making up her entire story. This reportedly sent her into a rage, and she ended up screaming at the top of her lungs, I have told you the truth, so help me God, and you know it. It was even said that as Jane was being taken out of the courtroom, Francis cracked a small but noticeable smile. When Francis and Willie were taken to the stand and questioned, both of them were calm and appeared not in the least concerned with being found guilty. 
As the questions continued, their composure never dropped, and much of those attending were surprised to see Francis handle the very personal questions so maturely. When it came time for a verdict, the courtroom, the outside media, and the town seemingly held their breath, and all but a handful let out a very disappointed sigh. Francis Hall and Willie Stevens were found not guilty, and the reality of the case hit home even harder. The frustration and fear began to grip the town again, as if Francis and Willie truly had no role in this crime and it was someone else entirely, then could they do it again? And would this case ever fully be solved? After the trial, there was of course talk all over, some still accusing Francis of being behind the whole thing, where others truly wondered if it was someone else entirely, or a group of people who were responsible. Officially, there have only ever been four suspects named in the Hall Mills case. The first and most known is of course Francis Hall, the widow of Edward Hall, and for many people, the prime and only suspect. But taking a look at Frances, we can see why so many people named her as the mastermind. For starters, as I previously mentioned, she had both the money and the motive to commit this crime. That was exactly what the prosecution painted, that she found out or had long since known about Edward's affair and had grown tired of it and finally snapped. With her being from a powerful family, it isn't hard to imagine her being able to pull strings to not only get away with it, but to also mastermind the crime in the first place. The second is Willie Stevens, also brought to trial with Francis. Willie was the brother of Francis, and seen by the media as the one who actually physically committed the crime, acting on the orders of Francis. The problem here is that many put the blame on Willie due to him being labeled at the time as being weak-minded. You have to remember that this was back in the 1920s and how people viewed those who suffered from an intellectual disability wasn't the best. The truth is, is that Willie had likely suffered from autism, but unfortunately the media labeled him as a crazy killer who knew no right from wrong and couldn't be controlled, viewing him more as a thing than as a human being. There are some facts though about Willie and this case that are hard to ignore. One being that Willie did own a small caliber weapon that used the same ammunition as the type in the crime. Yet it was later reported that the weapon had been modified so it couldn't actually be fired as to not hurt himself or others. Another thing was that his fingerprints were found on the business card left at the crime scene this is a problem though, because if you remember from the start of this video, over 100 people touched that card with their bare hands. So I have no idea how they, back in 1922, could have possibly gotten his sole fingerprint from that. True, he could have been the one to put the card there in the first place. Or he could have just as easily been one of the other 100 people that handled the card when it was being passed around. The third suspect is Henry Stevens, the brother of both Willie and Francis. It was said that Henry was a known marksman, and that Willie followed Henry around a lot. Some argued that Willie would have done anything that Henry told him to do without question, making it very easy for many to theorize that Henry simply told Willie what to do on the night of the crime, and Willie didn't contest it. Henry was named a suspect and was said to have also done the shooting. Yet, where things get tricky is I have read reports saying that Edward and Eleanor were shot at close range and others saying that it was from a long distance away. If it was indeed close range, like many are saying, then I can't imagine it would really matter if you are a marksman or not. Apart from this, there was nothing that tied Henry to the crime other than being the brother of Francis and Willie, and being a marksman. Henry, in fact, never even went to trial. He was arrested for the crime, but released after the second trial's verdict. The fourth and final suspect is Henry Carpenter, 
and this Henry, from what I could find, had no obvious signs of having anything to do with the crime. He was a stockbroker on Wall Street, and he was a cousin of Francis, and that seemingly was enough to arrest him, as I have found no evidence or even remote reason as to how he could have been involved, other than being related to the other suspects. These four suspects, all related, eventually had all charges against them dropped for lack of any evidence other than the eyewitness statement from Jane Gibson. And even her own witness statement couldn't be further from credible if she tried. The lack of any actual evidence, the massive media attention, the mishandling of evidence, it all added together to throw this case into limbo, where it has remained for almost a century. There were countless theories on this case, ranging from the obvious and most easy, that Frances had simply used her power and position to arrange the whole thing, and due to that power and position, allowed her to walk away free. While yes, I can see this fitting and being a somewhat obvious choice, Frances must have known that if she was responsible for the crime, then it was going to come back on her. Maybe she knew it would, and prepared for that. Maybe she did hire a group of people to take out her husband and his lover, and then following that, got rid of them. She did come from a very powerful family, and if true crime and history have taught us anything, it is that certain families are so powerful that they can get away with practically anything. Another theory that gained quite a bit of traction in the following years was that the crime had nothing to do with Francis, but instead a group of people who I don't even want to personally waste my breath naming. Let's say that they are a group of people who spew hate and wear white sheets, if you catch my drift. This group, who we all unfortunately are aware of, had a pretty large size back in the 1920s and they were no less shitty back then as they have been throughout history. So that truly comes as no surprise. But they saw themselves, especially back then, as some form of moral police, where they would take it upon themselves to be the judge, jury, and executioner for people who they saw as a threat. It was speculated that the group found out about Edward and Eleanor, and seeing what they were doing as a moral and a sin took it upon themselves to punish them. A big reason for them even being mentioned was due to the staging of the bodies and the torn love letters. Many people said that this was a classic move by them as they wanted their actions to be noticed and talked about by the media. They wanted their message to be heard, yet all of it was simply speculation. Moving on from that theory is a theory that many online have tossed around, and it's something that I feel has strong reasoning behind. I think that if you look at this from what is factually known, then it can paint a pretty strong picture. Okay, so obviously whoever committed this crime has a very high chance of actually knowing both Edward and especially Eleanor. I give extra attention to Eleanor due to the massive wounds that she received with being shot three times in the head, having her throat cut, and then having her tongue cut out is clearly a crime of rage and arguably passion. Someone knew her and felt incredibly betrayed. I am not pointing any blame at her husband, but I do find it odd that he was never even really named a suspect or taken to trial when Francis was. The amount of violence that occurred more often than not falls in line with actions of a betrayed, vengeful lover. Perhaps if it were in fact Eleanor's husband James, then he very clearly could fit that profile. The torn up love letters were also a sign that whoever read them clearly felt a lot of anger and seemingly wanted to taunt them even in death, as not only did they take their life, but also destroyed something special to them. Going further to the arrangement of the bodies, to me, also shows remorse. Perhaps after the anger ended, whoever did this felt guilt and wanted to somewhat make it right by putting them in a peaceful pose, 
It could also explain why Edward's hat was covering his face. The guilt may have been too great, which led them to not wanting to see him. But what truly stands out the most to me, that it was someone who was either married to one of them or knew them closely, was the fact that they positioned them in front of a crabapple tree. I did some searching and found out that from a religious standpoint, that a crabapple tree is a symbolism of love and marriage. So, you've got a couple who were both having an affair, both having a church background, and whose bodies were positioned so that they were in front of a tree that symbolizes something that they were going directly against. I feel that that tree being right there in front of them was a message that was loud and clear that whoever committed this crime felt betrayed, hurt, and heartbroken. Truth is, we may never know who committed this crime. It has been nearly 100 years since it occurred, and no other suspect has been named that can be proven to have been behind it. The media themselves lost interest in the case after the second trial, finding new things to talk about and new crimes to put front page. As a matter of fact, this case would actually be completely forgotten about by many for years to come due to the Great Depression, the Lindbergh kidnapping, and then World War II, all of this following the Hall Mill case. Keep in mind that this case was truly huge in terms of its publicity and attention, but even then, with seemingly obvious signs of the killer knowing the victims, the non-stop newspaper coverage, and a list of suspects, it still wasn't enough to ever get an answer as to who was responsible. What is known is that on September 14, 1922, Edward Hall and Eleanor Mills had their lives cut short. Two lovers who may have been trying to figure out a way to be together never got the chance. If there is any silver lining to this story, it is that they were able to be together in the end. Something that I think both of them would have wanted especially judging from a part of one of the letters Eleanor wrote to Edward, saying, Sweetheart, my true heart, I have the greatest part of all blessings, a noble man's deep, true, eternal love. Howard Stern is a name that most people are familiar with. For those who don't know of him, he is a popular radio personality with a career in broadcasting for over four decades. Known as a shock jock, Stern has been no stranger to controversy. In the long-running history of his self-titled show, The Howard Stern Show, he flooded the airways with his unpredictable and unfiltered opinions. He also has been considered as somewhat of a troll, even before that term was used to describe the typical internet meaning. Some of the controversies that Stern has gotten himself into range from poor taste to wondering how he even has a career anymore. Some examples are the following. In 1995, three days after the beloved singer Selena was shot and killed, as millions mourned, Stern instead responded by insulting her songs, downplaying her popularity, making racial remarks to her fan base, and performing a racist caricature of a Hispanic Selena fan. In 1999, 2005, and 2010, Stern was in the spotlight for insulting and judging female guests on his show, critiquing their weight, looks, and sexualizing them. And in 1999, the Dana Plato interview occurred. I won't go into full details here as it is too much to cover, but back in 1999, child actress Dana Plato appeared on the show. Dana, who had struggled with addiction and experienced things no person should have to, unfortunately made her a very easy target for people to attack her and make jokes at her expense. 
being that Stern allowed callers to berate her and didn't do much to stop them, acting more as an instigator, caused Dana to eventually break down crying on the air. The following day, Dana Plato took her own life. These are just a few examples of the types of controversies that Howard Stern has found himself in. He has always been known to be a prankster as well, having people call in claiming that they were abducted by aliens, that they were lost at sea, and a multitude of other crazy scenarios. And for the most part, they were proven as hoaxes done by employees of Stern's. So, when on August 13th, 1997, when a man called in claiming to be a serial killer, Stern figured it was just another caller trying to get their 15 minutes of fame by making up some bizarre story. Yet, as the caller kept on talking, the joking nature and skepticism began to fade away, and the true danger of the phone call that was happening live began to be realized. All right, I got a guy on the phone who claims he's been killing prostitutes and he's wondering why he's doing it. So maybe uh, he, he thinks I have an answer. Is this Ed? Ed? No, this isn't Ed. No. Oh. You haven't killed any prostitutes? No, I never said my name was Ed. Oh. Oh. Sorry. That's yeah, okay. What's your what name do you use? You can call me Clay. Clay? Clay? <laughs> yes, yeah. Clay. Okay, Clay. So what happened? How many prostitutes have you killed? Twelve. And you're wondering yeah. why you do it? I have a pretty good idea. Why? Did your mom beat you? Did your mom spank you? Did, uh... Was your mom a prostitute? No. Actually, nothing like that. What is it, then? I think I just do it for the sense of the power. And then what, you strangle them? Once. How else did you kill them? Well, a few times. Actually, most times with a hammer. Hmm. And where do you do this, primarily? Uh, I've done it twice in a parking garage. And the rest of the time's on the side of the road. And uh, you're from the New Orleans area? Yes. Hmm. And how, I mean, what are you, you beat them to death with a hammer? Man. Uh, it usually only takes once in it. Dude, you got to have a lot of anger in you. Yes. Man. Well, why do you need to feel so powerful? He's got some issue with women, but, like, some shrink's got to look into it. It's not even worried. I mean, you might as well just kill yourself if you've killed 15 people. And that means you're heartless. Did you used to kill small animals? No, I've killed a rat. Yeah. See, a lot of guys start out killing kittens for some reason. Yeah, they kill something before they start with humans. If my kid, like, killed a, a kitten or something cute, I'd probably just, you know, figure, well, this is it. They're going to be serial killers. Kill them. <laughs> Dude, you're a serial killer. So how old were, were you when you killed your first woman? Sixteen. And uh, you must be a powerful kind of guy, big guy. Uh, I wasn't then. Right. And uh, when you killed your first one, did you go in there knowing you were going to kill her, or it just sort of happened? I I knew I I had I really had it planned out. Hmm. You know, I wanted to do the whole sending clues. Right. Oh yeah. Are you in? To baffle people, but it turned out no one noticed for a long time. Right. Hmm. Like what, like you killed her on the side of the road. Uh, her that was the parking garage. Okay. And then what did you do with the body? You dumped that somewhere? Um. Yeah, actually, I think uh, she's probably one of the ones that they found. Yeah. But let me ask you something. You were sending clues that you were going to do this? No, I was uh, no, he was going like, to doing that. Yeah, he was going to leave like a note for the newspapers and, you know. Uh, but you decided not to. He didn't want to be famous or draw attention to himself. Hmm. Do you have a lot of tattoos? Uh, I don't have any tattoos. I wouldn't do that to myself. Right. And do you get high before you do this? Uh, I've gotten pretty drunk before. Mm. Yeah. A little ammo. <laughs> a little ammo. <laughs> Relax that shrink there. Well, I, I got to say, I wish you would die, but, uh, you know, what can I tell you? I, I Maybe this is sort of good that you're talking about it with me, and maybe it'll keep you under... Like, like maybe I can't get you to turn maybe yourself like in. a valve, and he'll be able to go another year or something. Yeah, but maybe uh, somehow, you know, you won't do it anymore. What about your kids? You want them living in a world with people like you? <laughs> hasn't really well, analyzed it that. Anyway, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Kind of lonely though. You can't tell anybody about this. I'm the only guy you can. Am I, am I the only guy you ever told about this? Yeah. Hmm. Wow. I guess that's sort of an honor. I've told a couple of women, Howard, but uh. They're dead. Yeah. You ever get? Do you, do you think the reason you're so angry is because you were abused or something? No, I wasn't abused, Howard. Hmm. Where's your family? 
You got a wife? I mean, you got a mom, a dad, a wife, children. You got any of that? I've got a couple of kids, but um, I no wife. I'm not married to the mother. Mm -hmm. You're a white guy. Oh uh, yeah. No. Are you on drugs? Ah, uh, I've done acid a few times. Mm. So so, so not, but nothing heavy. So after you killed after you killed the first sixty year old, like uh, you you finished you you finished. No, I was sixteen. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, how far apart are these murders? Like, do you murder and then like you feel satisfied for a while? Um, I don't even understand why I do it, Howard. I don't know if, if I ever get any satisfaction. Hmm. But um, how how the often the gather anywhere was uh the same night? Really? You killed two people in the same night? Yeah, but I went to Mississippi for the second one. Hmm. So there's no pattern to how many weeks or days between murders. No. Look into their eyes and go, you know, gee, these these people were just children at one point, and maybe they just had a tough life. And I've let a couple go. You have. Like, what happened? You're in the middle of killing them, and then they, and then they what do they say? Why would you let one go uh, and kill the other? There was this one. Go ahead. Uh, I think she was probably really new to it. Yeah. I, there was just something about her. Maybe she reminded me of my fiance, but right. You somehow more, relate more, more of an innocent quality. I just you somehow felt bad for her. Yeah. Hmm. And you have a fiance, so you're planning to get I, married? I, no. He had one. Oh, he had one. No, no. Um, if I wouldn't be a suspect, uh, believe me, she'd. Are you a big fat mess, or are you like a fairly good-looking guy? Oh, I'm not a big fat mess. I wouldn't call myself good looking. I don't know what I'd call myself, Howard. Right. Do you have a decent job and all that stuff? Sounds like a bright uh, guy. Not decent like you have. Yeah, well, we got ridiculous jobs. <laughs> you can't get these. Jobs. I don't even know that I'd call this a job. <laughs> when was the last time you killed? It, it's been a few months. Right. Actually, it's it, it's been going on a year. Hmm. You're like the Boston Strangler, man. Maybe I should offer you your story. Now, it goes without question that this could have easily been staged by Stern himself or whoever Clay was. Again, people would call in all the time with these wild stories that would easily be seen as a hoax or too incredible to be real. However, with this call, it is obvious that not even a full two minutes into the call that Stern and his co-host Robin began to change their demeanor regarding this call. At first, playing him off as someone making a sick joke, but as Clay started to not only keep up this act, but then go into details about why he does what he does, the entire mood changed. Even when I was first listening to this call, I got chills. As the call goes on, you start to notice that Stern is trying to get information out of Clay, asking if he has any tattoos, if he was or is married, trying to get an idea of his physical appearance, and more. Clay, probably knowing what Stern was doing, indulged him, but he could have just as easily been lying about what he looks like. I also noticed that Stern was trying to potentially get a reaction out of Clay by insulting him at times, making him feel that he isn't cool or should be a celebrity on the news. He attacked him, calling him a loser, saying that he wished he was dead. All of those things one would think would get some kind of hostile reaction out of a person. But through the entire phone call, Clay didn't appear to sound angry at this notion. The almost remarkable thing about Clay was that he was so forthcoming about not only the crimes that he had committed, but also himself, not bothering in the least of talking about his childhood and even giving somewhat of a generalized location to where he lived. Now, it was reported that the next day the FBI arrived at Stern's studio and took the recording to analyze. This, however, is all of the information that came out about that. Stern himself never really mentioned this after the event. As frustrating as it all was, there really was no way to prove if Clay was even responsible for these crimes, or if they even happened in the first place. That was until the FBI later stated that the call was genuine, as the details that Clay gave were not public record, the media hadn't covered it, and the only people who knew of those intimate details were law enforcement and those responsible for the crime itself. But of course, I had to do more digging, as this whole rabbit hole seemed to continue getting deeper and deeper. One name that continuously got brought up in relation to Clay was a man named Russell Elwood. Elwood lived in New Orleans for around 30 years, from the late 60s to the late 90s. In that time, he worked odd jobs and struggled with several addictions. 
He also frequented prostitutes and during one of his arrests was stated as saying that he knew over 100 of them by name. The crimes varied in severity, but most were tied to minor offenses where he would spend anywhere from a few days to a few weeks in jail. However, in 1997, while Elwood was incarcerated in a county jail, it was alleged that he confessed to numerous killings of prostitutes in the New Orleans area. He said that he would take them to areas outside of the city where he would beat them and strangle them, then dispose of their bodies in various canals. Because of this, after his release, he was heavily monitored by police and interviewed several times. During those interviews, though, they were anything but informative. Elwood was said to have admitted to police that he was responsible for the murders, but then he would go back on his word and say that he didn't remember what he said, or flat out refuse that he had anything to do with them. Obviously, this created problems. Elwood also claimed the only reason he even admitted to them was due to him having, and I quote, really bad mental problems. Elwood was eventually connected to two murders and later sentenced, yet if we go back to Clay, he was admitting he was responsible for 12. But what a lot of people who link these two together seem to forget is that there is one giant glaring call in the idea that Elwood is Clay, and that is due to when the Clay call happened. It was on August 7th, 1997. Three days earlier on the 4th, Elwood was arrested and began serving an 85-day jail sentence. So, unless he made that call from a jail that would have clearly been monitored, then there was no possible way it could have been Elwood. The rest is all people trying to connect dots or force a narrative that Russell Elwood was Clay, when in fact there is proof that this is not the case. So where does that leave us? Who was or is the mysterious Clay that called Howard Stern to talk about his crimes? Well, unfortunately, nowhere. There has been no information about Clay since the night of that phone call. There is no hard evidence linking who Clay could be and the entire event is still argued to this day on if it was in fact a hoax or if it was the real thing. People have pointed out how Clay speaks, how he forgets certain things, and how he has no reaction to certain insults as it being staged. Yet others argue that Stern was known for his very over-the-top and shocking content. So it would stand to reason if this was in fact a stunt, then surely Stern would have wanted to make it more… dramatic. Regardless of what can be argued as fact, and what is all just a made-up story, the mystery of who Clay was will remain a topic of debate for the foreseeable future. However, if it were real, and Clay really was a serial killer who was never caught, then there is a chance he is still out there. Nobody knowing his face, and nobody knowing what he truly could be capable of. Who knows? You may even know him. Halloween is one of the most popular holidays of the year. It's not only my personal favorite holiday, but practically everyone else that I know of loves the spooky night more than any other. That was no exception to 21-year-old Cindy Song. When, on Halloween night in 2001, Cindy and two of her friends, Stacy Pike and Lisa Kim, were celebrating the night by attending a costume party at the Players' Nightclub at Penn State University. Cindy wore a bunny costume with a white tennis skirt, bunny ears, and a tail. Cindy, Stacy, and Lisa enjoyed the night and left sometime around 2 a.m. They hadn't burned out all of their energy, however, and decided to go to another friend's apartment where they continued partying and playing video games. Around 4 a.m., Cindy was dropped off by her friends at her apartment. As Cindy made her way out of the car and headed to her apartment door, it would be the last time that anyone ever saw her. Later that day, Cindy's roommate returned to the apartment and noticed that Cindy wasn't home, not giving it much thought and assuming that she was either out with friends or at work. After all, the door was locked and the entire apartment looked completely normal. 
However, as the days passed and nobody could recall seeing or hearing from Cindy in the last three days, the worry of her friends grew and eventually on November 4th, a call was made to the police to report a missing person. When police arrived at the apartment, they noticed that again, the apartment and Cindy's room seemed perfectly normal. It was also confirmed that Cindy did indeed make it back to her apartment as her backpack and phone were in her bedroom and she had those with her on the night that she was last seen. This told police that she had made it home and didn't meet with any sort of foul play in the apartment. It went on to be speculated that Cindy left her apartment shortly after getting home to go to a convenience store that was a short walk from her home. Police made this assumption due to her keys and purse being missing from her apartment. It was also stated that she frequently visited this convenience store. Police then checked her phone records and credit card activity and saw that no phone calls had been made and there was no activity or use on her credit card. Police realizing this was incredibly suspicious dug deeper and began checking her emails. They found no suspicious evidence here either and began to wonder if she willingly disappeared. Cindy was, after all, dealing with a lot on her plate. She had a very intense and busy school schedule. She worked two jobs and was supposed to be graduating in the following spring. Perhaps all of it became far too much for her and she needed to get away from it all for a while. But when that idea was tossed around to her friends and family, they immediately rejected it. It had been Cindy's plan to be on a tight curriculum and she enjoyed working. What some could see as a full plate, to Cindy, she preferred it that way. On top of that, Cindy was also set to go to a concert a few days later as the tickets were found in her bedroom. And Cindy had also ordered a computer that was going to be delivered the day after she was last seen. Searches by volunteers led to no clues in the surrounding area of Cindy's apartment, and police were completely stumped on what could have happened to the friendly and outgoing college senior. A few days later, after Cindy had disappeared, over 200 miles away in Philadelphia, witnesses were shocked when they saw a woman that matched the description of Cindy being forcefully dragged into a car. The woman was screaming, kicking, and fighting to get away from a man. The man was said to have yelled at the witnesses to stay out of it. This man then shoved the woman and himself into the car and sped away. While a report was filed about the abduction and a sketch was released of the man, even though there was a similarity to the unknown woman and Cindy, no leads came from it, and for the next two years, the case remained cold. That was until 2003, when the most unlikely source came forward claiming to have information on Cindy's song. The source of information was from an informant named Paul Weekly, who was an accomplice to a man named Michael Krakowski. Krakowski was said to have assisted another man, Hugo Solinsky, in abducting and murdering Cindy, then burying her on Solinsky's property around his home. Solinsky was soon after brought in for questioning and admitted that he had abducted Cindy, but that it was Krakowski who was the one responsible for killing her. He also stated that Krakowski kept Cindy's bunny ears from her Halloween outfit as a souvenir. It was said that the only reason Cindy was even kidnapped was because in her outfit, walking on the side of the road, they thought that she was a prostitute and decided to abduct her. Armed with this information, police raided Selinsky's home and began to excavate his yard. When all was said and done, 12 bodies were found in Hugo Selinsky's backyard, one of those bodies belonging to Michael Krakowski, along with Krakowski's girlfriend. Yet, shockingly, even then, the other ten bodies were all tested, and none of them were linked to Cindy's song. After this shocking discovery and realization that Hugo Selinsky was a serial killer, attention was focused back on the man who started this entire thing, Paul Weekly. Weekly began to lose a lot of credibility with the police after the discovery of the bodies as his story and the facts of the case were no longer lining up. Eventually, Weekly confessed that he aided Selinsky in the deaths of Michael and his girlfriend. Weekly lost even more credibility when police searched his computer and found dozens of articles and information around Cindy's case. 
Police later stated that Weekly had studied the case in great detail and decided to come forward as an informant, where he would pin the crime on Krakowski and Selinsky. Krakowski having already been killed by this point, and since Weekly assisted Selinsky in that, it would be one less loose end for Weekly to have to worry about. He figured with the overwhelming evidence on Selinsky that nobody would believe him when he tried to say that Weekly was involved. When everything was said and done, however, both Selinsky and Weekly were given life sentences. Yet, what happened to Cindy Song? With Selinsky admitting that he had been the one who abducted her and that the one responsible for her murder was now dead, it doesn't give police much to go on, since they can't exactly interrogate a corpse. In the years since the arrest, Weekly and Selinsky have given no more information on Cindy, and it has led many to wonder if Krakowski really was the one responsible for Cindy's death. Her case is still open to this day, yet no leads have been made in the case of Cindy Song. With no reported sighting of Cindy, the story of the woman matching her description, the one that was being shoved into the car, was eventually dismissed, and any other possible theory has been looked over and cleared. It appears that the tragic, yet mysterious case of Cindy Song will stay in the state of limbo for the time being. While there are many who believe that she was murdered, most debate comes from who actually did it. Granted, it is not hard to put the blame on Selinsky. He did, after all, kill 12 people, yet he was only ever charged in two of them. It doesn't exactly seem unreasonable to say that he was the one who actually did this crime. I would love to hear what all of you think about this case. Do you think Selinsky did it? Or do you think it was something else altogether? The internet is something that we use every single day, checking email, posting selfies, and watching funny videos. We use it as a means of education, entertainment, and escapism. You can make lifelong friends from a chat room or find a new love interest from online dating. Truthfully, there is no shortage of things to do online and no shortage of people to meet. Some good and some not so good. Matthew Falder falls into the category of individuals so evil, you'd think that he was straight out of a horror movie. I will warn everyone here, what I am about to talk about is going to be heavily censored, and even then it will contain very disturbing material. I ask anyone who wishes not to hear discussions of self-harm, various forms of assault, or bullying to just close the video now. For those who have stayed, Tread lightly as you are about to hear the story of Matthew Falder, the man with 70 faces. Matthew Falder on the outside was seen as friendly, outgoing, and the life of the party to his friends and co-workers. He was as well a gifted student and obtained both his master's and doctoral in seismic oceanography. But beneath the personality he had with the public, on the inside and behind a computer screen, he was labeled by the National Crime Agency as one of the most prolific and depraved offenders that they had ever encountered. Matthew's crime started back in 2009, where he would become close with his victim and through that, obtain personal and intimate knowledge about them. After gaining this, he would completely change and begin blackmailing them, not for money or personal favors, but instead he aimed at using his victims as he saw fit. He would demand his victims to document themselves through both photo and video to carry out very disturbing and disgusting acts on both themselves and others. Not caring the pain or trauma that he inflicted on his victims, they were there purely for his entertainment. As time went on, the depravity and true horror of Matthew increased. His strategy that he used where he would find a victim, gain their trust, and then use that against them became more defined and almost second nature to him. The kinds of things that he subjected people to 
are things that I cannot talk about on YouTube. And truthfully, I wouldn't want to mention it even if I could. Some of the more tamer things Matthew forced people to do were film themselves licking public toilet seats, punching a random person in public, eating dog food, and having people shave their own heads. The abuse continued more and more, and there seemed to be no end of Matthew's rampage. On several occasions, victims of Matthew's would beg and plead with him to stop the harassment and leave them alone. He would of course ignore these and continue the bullying, leading several of his victims to hurt themselves, and some to attempt things that went even further, if you catch my drift. This cycle of abuse continued dozens of more times. Each time he would do the same thing, charm someone into trusting him, and then letting the monster out. For eight years, he was able to stay hidden behind various deep web forum boards, multiple different accounts and profiles, as well as using heavily encrypted email addresses. In fact, the amount of profiles and accounts that Matthew had numbered well over 70. The thing that led to Matthew being caught though was that he would post the photos and videos of his victims to various websites on the deep web for others to see. In 2015, the NCA was monitoring several of these websites where they came across horrifying material all coming from the same user, 666devil. Looking at his posting content, they could tell that whoever this was was a truly disturbed person who needed to be caught. That, however, proved trickier than originally thought. So much so that a task force was created that involved GCHQ, US Homeland Security, Europol, Australian Federal Police, New Zealand Police, and Israel Police. This operation was one of the largest in its scale during that time. Matthew continued his evil acts on helpless victims, who were essentially being controlled by someone they had never met. After years of investigation and sifting through some of the darkest content online, authorities were finally able to identify Matthew, and on June 21, 2017, he was arrested at his work. When he was being read a list of his offenses, Matthew remarked that it sounded like a rap sheet from hell. Once he was arrested, he was later taken to Birmingham Crown Court, where he was read his full list of offenses. The total amount of victims numbered over 50. The number of offenses maxed out at a staggering 188 separate offenses, and it took over 30 minutes to read each charge out. Matthew ended up pleading guilty to 51 of those charges. When more information came out about the victims, it was learned that the youngest was aged only 14, and several of them came forward to state that they would never fully recover from the damage that Matthew inflicted on them. On October 16, 2017, Matthew Falder pled guilty to 137 offenses against 46 victims. He was then sentenced to 25 years in prison with a potential of 33 years. It truly bothers me, and no doubt countless others, that he didn't receive life, when the crimes he committed will stay with those he hurt forever. When asked about his various crimes, Matthew said that he never felt any type of remorse for his victims. He never cared if they lived or died, and he never cared how this would affect their lives. He said that his ultimate goal was to mentally damage and torment as many people as he could. And this probably comes as little surprise hearing this now, but during his sentencing, it was said that Matthew showed no emotion at all. This was seen by the judge who told Matthew that he was an internet highwayman who was warped and sadistic. If anything can be said about this case, it's that those who Matthew inflicted his horrors on were the true heroes of this story. They were able to find the courage to speak out against the torment that they went through on a daily basis from him. If you or anyone that you know of are experiencing forms of bullying or harassment, please know that there are groups out there who can and want to help you. Please, if you know something is wrong, report it. Standing up and fighting those who are attempting to control a person can be stopped, and they will pay for their crimes. This concludes the first entry into Disturbing Deep Dives. The world is full of stories like this. 
tales that bask in mystery and live in darkness. Things that we may think could never be true, or only possible in a movie, can just as easily be made into reality by a single person. Say what you will about TikTok, whether you love it or hate it, it is easily one of the most popular forms of entertainment available today. I know there is no need for me to go into the details of what TikTok is, so I won't waste anyone's time with that. We all know it's a place for funny, creative, and interesting videos. In the past few years, there has been an explosion of content creators on the platform that have gone from accounts nobody knew of to viral sensations with millions of followers. One of those creators who went by the handle, Gen Kid, was someone who I remember seeing on my own For You page, particularly his Skyrim videos. They were honestly very funny, and anybody who has played Skyrim will no doubt find the humor in his videos as well. Apart from those videos, he also did impersonations, including movie characters like Tony Montana and John Wick. Jen Kid, otherwise known as Ali Nassar Abulaban, ran the account and frequently included his wife, Anna Marie Abulaban. Together, the couple seemed to be living the life that so many of us wish to have. They had what appeared to be the perfect drama-free relationship. They lived in an upscale neighborhood in San Diego in a luxury apartment complex and they both appeared to be doing what they loved. It was obvious that comedy was a strong passion of Ali's, and he quickly began to develop a fan base that saw each upload of his on both his TikTok and YouTube accounts skyrocket as his popularity increased. But the unfortunate thing about the online lifestyle is that they often only show the happy and good sides of life, and never the ugly parts. And for some couples, the dark and ugly side tend to outweigh the bright and beautiful side. And unfortunately, Ali and Anna fell into that latter category. From what was seen on the screens of the loyal followers of Ali was a far cry from the nightmare that Anna was finding herself in far too often. And not just Anna was subject to horrible things, but the couple's five-year-old daughter, who was also included in several of Ali's TikToks, no doubt witnessed the abuse and fighting that took place inside of the Abulaban's home. The arguments that would take place between Ali and Anna would unfortunately escalate from heated arguments to physical violence. In a three-month period, there were nine separate phone calls made to the police, all revolving around the same thing, a domestic violence situation. The situations differed from one instance of Ali smacking Anna in the face to another where Ali actually pushed Anna into a wall. The incredibly frustrating part here is that in those nine separate times that police were called, all for the same thing, in all of those nine different times, Ali was never arrested, and Anna was left in the environment that she desperately wanted freedom from. One of the incidents that occurred during these three months was when one night Anna ran to one of her neighbors who lived down the hall and asked them if she could use their phone to call the police because during a fight, Ali took and broke Anna's phone. Once again, police were called and even though there was clear evidence of abuse happening, nothing was done to Ali and he continued to stay in the house. The troubling thing about all of this is that during these three months, while the abuse was going on, Ali was still regularly uploading his videos to both his TikTok and his YouTube accounts, acting as if nothing had been going on, and to those watching his videos and laughing, they had no idea of the horror that he was inflicting on both his wife and his daughter on numerous occasions. On October 18th, 2021, Anna, seemingly at her emotional end to the abuse that she was suffering, told Ali to move out of their apartment and that she was pursuing a divorce. Ali, not surprisingly, wasn't happy about this and tried talking Anna out of this decision. Anna was even threatening getting a restraining order against him, which no doubt could have impacted him not seeing their daughter at all. Fearing this, Ali agreed to move out of the apartment and get a hotel nearby. I am not sure if Ali was hoping that the separation would give the couple enough space so that in time they could eventually work things out, 
but it seemed to Anna that she was for sure moving forward with the divorce and was making moves for that to happen. I believe Anna had long since made her decision to leave the marriage, and I don't think anybody can blame her. Before Ali moved out though, he secretly made a copy of their apartment key and three days later, on October 21st, 2021, he went back to the apartment and once inside, using his copied key, he wrecked the place. Proving that even though Ali could lie and try to tell Anna that he would change and become a better husband and father, that deep down, he was just a coward who resorted to harming those that he should have only ever shown love and compassion. After finishing wrecking the apartment, Ali installed an app on his daughter's iPad that allowed him to remotely listen in on what was going on in the apartment. After doing this, he left and went back to his hotel. Now, I am not sure if Ali trashed the apartment because he wanted to send a message to Anna to not go through with the divorce, or if it was a scare tactic to have it appear someone broke in and she would ask him to move back in. I am under the impression that Anna never knew Ali had a key, so perhaps to Ali, that was a rational thought. Later that same day, while back at his hotel, Ali decided to open the application that he had installed on his daughter's iPad and listen in. Essentially spying on Anna at this point, and what Ali expected to hear, which could have been Anna crying or being angry, instead, he heard laughing. And it was Anna. And she wasn't alone. Ali then heard a man's voice and again, more laughter. Blinded by rage, Ali quickly grabbed his keys and made his way to the apartment. As Ali arrived at the apartment complex and got out of the car, he had something else with him. A gun. Ali stormed up to the apartment that he and Anna once shared together. Ali rushed in the door and saw Anna sitting on the couch with a man. This man was 29-year-old Rayburn Barron. Now this is where the story gets a little messy, as according to Ali, Rayburn actually had his arm around Anna and they were seen kissing on the couch. Yet, I have read in other reports that they were simply sitting on the couch talking, that Rayburn was sitting on the couch and Anna was in the kitchen, and that Rayburn and Anna were in bed together. So what Rayburn and Anna were doing is anyone's guess, but the moment Ali saw Rayburn with Anna, he saw red. The next thing anybody knew, shots were heard echoing from the apartment. After four shots, Anna and Rayburn were dead and Ali ran out of the apartment, out the front door, got in his car, and sped off. Neighbors heard the shots and quickly called police. Once police and EMTs arrived, they pronounced both Anna and Rayburn dead on the scene. Police, knowing Anna's frequent calls about domestic abuse and now seeing that she and another man are dead in the apartment that she shared with Ali, it didn't take a genius for them to know who they needed to be looking for. At this exact same time, Ali was rushing to the school that his daughter attended. While he was on the way there, Ali called his mother and confessed to what he had done and that he didn't know what to do. Once he picked up his daughter, he told her that he hurt mommy and then they began to drive. I can't imagine what was going on through that little girl's mind when she was told by her own father that he had hurt mommy. After driving for around 45 minutes, police located Ali and quickly surrounded his car. With their weapons drawn, but knowing that his daughter was in the back seat, they began to reason with him to get out of the car and surrender. And thankfully, Ali did and didn't decide to go out another way. His daughter was quickly grabbed by the police and taken to safety, and Ali was arrested. With the overwhelming evidence of having the weapon used in the crime in his possession, the frequent reports of abuse made by Anna to police in the months prior, the fact that Anna was moving forward with a divorce, and even having security camera footage of Ali fleeing that apartment, you would think that this would be an open and shut case, given the evidence presented. Yet shockingly, Ali went on to plead not guilty. In fact, Ali himself tried to move the blame completely from him and instead blame Anna for the cause of everything that happened. It's almost as if Ali thinks that due to his social media presence and fame that he can turn this thing around and actually boost his career and get more people talking about him. I think that he truly feels that he was the victim here and that what he did to Anna was out of love and that she was the reason he did what he did because she was trying to push him out of her life. 
It shows that Ali Nassar Abulaban cares for nothing but himself, that he can't even own up to the crime he committed and will lash out at anyone who says different. There was even an example of this this year on January 25th, when during a preliminary hearing, a police officer took the stand and was asked if Ali had experienced a traumatic event, and the police officer's response was, yeah, one that he created. And according to reports, Ali went into a full-on rage and began screaming at the officer. Ali, not seeming to be one to shy away from showing that he does have a temper, shockingly agreed to be interviewed and it went anything but calm. But what were you thinking? driving to the apartment. I'm driving, I'm screaming, I'm crying. I'm like, don't do it. What happens when you get to the apartment? I go up. What did you think? What did you think? Ali Nassar Abulaban was later charged and he will go to trial and there is a possibility that if he is convicted then he could receive the death penalty. This case is still ongoing though and from what I have found the trial itself has not even begun yet. I am sure in the coming months more will come to light about the trial itself and what will happen to the monster who used to bring a smile to so many faces. I hope that Ali and Anna's daughter is getting the support and love that she both needs and deserves. And I hope that the media themselves do not try throwing her into the spotlight because I think that is one of the last things that that little girl needs. This story goes to show that you never really know what a person can be capable of or who someone may be once the camera is not on them. Ali Nassar Abulaban or Jen Kid had a very bright future. He had a loving and beautiful family, and he was in a position where his passion was his full-time job, a gift that not many people can say they experience. And he destroyed all of it, leaving a path of destruction once the smoke had finally cleared. Need something? Need something? Need something? Need something? Need something? Looking to protect yourself or deal some damage? Where, hey, where'd you go? The story of Dorothy Jane Scott sounds like something straight out of a modern horror movie, and when I was reading her story, I couldn't help but see the comparisons in her story to that of a plotline from a movie that we have all seen at one point or another. What happened to her was both horrifying and had a sense of drama to it, or something straight out of Hollywood. Dorothy Jane Scott was one of those people who was just naturally kind and caring. 
being described by her family and friends as someone who very much wanted to live a quiet life, being devoted to both her religion and her son. Dorothy was a single mother living in Stanton, California. She was 43 years old and worked two jobs to support herself and her son. From everyone who knew Dorothy, nothing seemed out of place in her life. She was simply an independent and caring woman who was doing her best to make ends meet and not live a life in the spotlight. She was known to never drink, do drugs, or even date that often according to her parents, which is what made the series of events that led to May 28, 1980 even more shocking. But before I get there, I need to go back a few months, three to be exact to show what all Dorothy had been going through and how her life went from normal to a living nightmare. It all started when Dorothy began receiving phone calls from a stranger, a man claiming to know where she was always, her daily routine, where she lived, worked, and even where her parents lived. Dorothy was aware that she had a stalker, but unfortunately, back in the 80s, stalking was not taken that seriously at least nowhere near how it is today. And even today, from stories personal friends of mine have told me, if you have a stalker, you must jump through so many hoops to have anything done about it that it almost makes the entire ordeal not even worth the energy. Dorothy may have known this to be the case as well, even back then, because for several months she had been receiving these phone calls. The calls would range from devotion to rage. The caller would never stay on the line for long, but when he did call, he was either confessing his love for her or telling her that he was going to harm her. It got so bad that police got involved and installed a recorder on her phone line, but as I just mentioned, the calls were so short that there was never a way for them to trace the call. One of the biggest scares that Dorothy went through came a few weeks after installing that recorder. Dorothy's phone rang and the voice told her to go outside because he had something for her. Dorothy, both scared and angry, went outside and quickly saw that on her car's windshield was a dead rose. And it didn't stop there either. About a week later, Dorothy received another call from the stranger who claimed that he would get her alone and in his words, cut her up into little bits so no one would ever find her. It had gotten so bad by this point that Dorothy had started to take up karate lessons for self-defense and was considering purchasing a handgun. Why this really impacts me with researching this topic is it went from a woman who would seemingly never have harmed anyone to now being someone who must consider going to these measures to ensure her protection. I am not saying that she is wrong or going overboard by doing this. I just found it sad how much this woman had to alter her life because of this stranger who was tormenting her. All of this finally led to May 28, 1980. That night, while at a work meeting, Dorothy noticed that one of her co-workers seemed very sick. Come to find out, her co-worker, Conrad Bostron, had been bitten by a spider. Being the thoughtful and caring woman that Dorothy was, she, along with another co-worker, Pam Head, took Conrad to the hospital for treatment. While there, it was reported later by Pam that Dorothy never left her side and that while they were there waiting, they sat beside each other and Dorothy appeared to be behaving normally. After Conrad was treated, Dorothy said that she would go outside to pull the car up so he wouldn't have to walk that far in his condition. Pam stayed behind to wait with Conrad and when Pam and Conrad walked out of the front entrance, they saw Dorothy's car and the next thing they knew, the car turned on its high beams and sped past Pam and Conrad. The car then made a sudden turn out of the parking lot and took off down the road. Now at this moment, Pam had no knowledge of what was going on with Dorothy and her stalker. In fact, neither Conrad or Pam even reported Dorothy as missing until hours later, and this was because they had originally thought an emergency could have happened with Dorothy's son, and that is why she left in such a hurry. However, when Pam found out a few hours later that nobody had seen Dorothy, the police were notified. Around 4.30 a.m. on May 29th, around five hours after Dorothy was last seen, her car was found 10 miles away from the hospital engulfed in flames, and no sign of Dorothy was ever reported that morning or in the following days. Two weeks after Dorothy's disappearance and apparent abduction, the phone calls began again, but this time it was to Dorothy's mother, Vera. 
The call started with, Are you related to Dorothy Scott? Well, I've got her. Following these phone calls, Vera began to receive them almost every Wednesday afternoon, and with the more the stranger called, the more details he told to Vera. One example being that on the night Dorothy disappeared, before she got to the hospital, she actually ran by her house to change scarves. She was originally wearing a thinner black scarf. She later changed it for a thicker red one. The stranger told Vera that he knew the color scarf that she was wearing when she went to her work meeting, that she went home to change, and then what she was wearing when he took her. This was among other details that the caller gave Vera that were not given to the media, incriminating him more in being responsible for Dorothy's nightmare and eventual abduction. During this time in the following weeks since Dorothy went missing, the police were adamant on Vera and Jacob, Dorothy's parents, to not give any details to the media as it could severely hinder the case. But with no progress seeming to be made, Jacob Scott finally gave in and contacted the local newspaper to spread some information about the case in hopes of getting some answers to finding his daughter. The day a newspaper ran the story, Vera received a phone call from the same man and he finally gave some insights as to why he did what he did. He claimed that he and Dorothy were in a relationship and that she was cheating on him. This was never proven or even known for that matter. Vera and Jacob didn't know much about Dorothy's dating life and had no idea of if what the caller was saying was true or not. Although they did lean on the side of not believing him simply because they knew their daughter and wouldn't see why she would keep a relationship secret, granted it could be possible, but it could also be that this stalker felt betrayed by Dorothy, that she may have gone on a date with another man, and she truly may have never even known who the stalker was, but to him, she belonged to him, and he saw any potential man as a threat. The case of Dorothy stayed cold for another four years following the discovery of her car. Yet that whole time, Vera still received phone calls. For four years, the stranger, seemingly never tiring of the pain that he continued inflicting on the family. Things seemingly changed though in April of 1984, when yet again another call was made to Vera. Yet this time, Jacob answered the phone and the caller immediately hung up. For the next several months, the calls seemingly stopped. That was until August 6th, 1984. When skeletal remains were found near a construction site, the odd thing that was noticed by police was that there were two sets of bones, one human and the other belonging to a dog. The dog remains were seemingly buried on top of the human remains. The bones showed signs of being burned, which told police that they had been there for at least two years, as in 1982 there had been a fire in that area. The remains were eventually able to be identified as belonging to Dorothy Jane Scott. The dog bones are a mystery still to this day, as Dorothy did not own a dog, and neither did her parents. There was also a ring found with the remains that was later identified by Vera as belonging to Dorothy as well as a watch that had stopped at 12.32 a.m. on May 29th, just an hour after Dorothy originally disappeared. The location of where the remains were found was around 10 miles from where Dorothy's car was discovered. Having some closure that they could finally, at least, bury their daughter, Vera and Jacob still continued to receive phone calls from the one claiming to be responsible for what happened. One day, Vera received yet another phone call, and the caller simply asked, Is Dorothy there? Since 1984, there have been no breakthroughs on the case of Dorothy Jane Scott. Sadly, both Vera and Jacob have since passed away never knowing justice, and never being able to identify the one responsible. However, there is one theory on this matter. While there is nothing concrete or any viable proof that it happened, it was enough for people to run with it as a theory. There was a man named Mike Butler who was believed by Dorothy's son to be the one responsible for what happened to his mother. The reason for his name even being mentioned was that Mike Butler had a sister who worked with Dorothy. 
From several accounts, many said that Mike had become obsessed with Dorothy. He was described as a very unstable man who was said to have been involved in cult activities. This fueled the theory even more given that many say the remains of both dog and human remains were cult-like in nature. Another important part of this theory was that Jacob had actually met Mike on several occasions and spoken with him. This played into the theory of why the caller hung up when Jacob answered the phone, since if it was in fact Mike who was making these calls, then he feared Jacob would recognize his voice. This I can see as being a reason why. After all, he had no issue calling and taunting Vera for years, but the moment Jacob answered the phone, he hung up and then didn't call again for months. The theory goes further and says that the reason for what happened to Dorothy on the night she disappeared was because Mike saw her leaving work with Conrad. He assumed that she was with another man and that could have sent him over the edge. Yet all of this is speculation and even though police were well aware of him, there was no concrete evidence linking Mike to this crime. Mike Butler died in 2014, so there is little they can do on that end anyway. If Mike was the one responsible, or if it was someone completely different, then hopefully one day, this case can be marked as closed. But until then, the story of Dorothy Jane Scott will continue to live on in this state of limbo. The old expression of a picture being worth a thousand words has stood the test of time repeatedly. From the 1932 picture of lunch atop a skyscraper, the 1989 photo of Tank Man, and the 1936 photograph of Migrant Mother are just a few iconic pictures that have etched their way into history. There are hundreds of pictures that have been cemented in our brains that depict joy, sadness, courage, and overall, life. In 2014, 22-year-old college student Darsh Patel took a picture. It wasn't a beautiful shot of nature or a group picture with his friends. Instead, it was a picture of a bear. And that bear would be the reason why Darsh would never leave those woods alive. On September 21st, 2014, Darsh Patel went hiking in the Apshawa Preserve in West Milford, New Jersey. Along with his four friends, the group enjoyed the natural beauty of the area and were spending the day walking the various trails. A couple, separate from Darsh's group, were also walking on the preserve when they noticed that a massive black bear was nearby. Knowing of how dangerous that situation could be, the couple turned around and made their way out of the area. That same couple quickly ran into Darsh and his friends and warned them of the bear sighting and insisted they turn around also. Unfortunately, Darsh and his friends continued their path and wanted to see the bear for themselves. Not long after this, they did in fact see the massive 300 pound black bear and from what they thought was a safe distance, began to take pictures of it. This was the final photograph that Darsh Patel took. At this point, the bear was less than 30 feet away from them. Realizing that the bear was slowly approaching, the group decided to start making their way back out of the preserve. As they did this, they kept noticing that the bear was quickly closing the distance behind them. Then, the worst thing that could have happened, did. The bear broke out into a full sprint. It may come as either a little shock or a complete surprise, but bears, despite their size, can move very quickly, upwards of 35 miles per hour. For reference, Usain Bolt, who many regard as the fastest human in the world, can only run 27 miles per hour. Running from a bear is what many consider fatal, and they will not be able to beat it in a foot race, and that the only hope is to try to get to an elevated position where the bear cannot climb. Darsh and his friends broke into a full-on run and eventually the group got separated. Darsh was the unfortunate one that the bear decided to pursue. Darsh was last seen by his friends attempting to climb a rock and was yelling at his friends to keep running. After his friends made it to the end of the preserve, 
they noticed that Darsh wasn't there. His friends quickly called police and once they arrived, they began searching the area, on high alert, knowing what was stalking around in the woods. About two hours after police arrived, they found the bear, as well as the lifeless body of Darsh Patel. The bear was put down by police and after confirming the area was clear, Darsh's body was recovered and his phone was able to be salvaged. Even though the phone itself had a bite mark in it from the bear, it was still able to have its contents removed, which in turn led to those pictures that Darsh took to be released to the public. After the tragic event, many were puzzled that the attack even took place. Darsh's friends insisted they did nothing to provoke the bear, and even then, most bears are typically fearful of humans, especially black bears. The Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources had this to say about the attack. Most bear attacks are defensive, and the bear provides many warning signs. Predatory attacks do not have the same warning signs and can escalate without much warning at all. Lynn Rogers, a biologist with the Wildlife Research Institute, was quoted as saying about one black bear out of a million would have done that. Which makes sense, given that in the past century, there have only been six recorded black bear attacks. This truly looks like it was ultimately a very unfortunate and tragic event. If any of you are avid hikers, take this story as a warning to always be careful and observant when in an area where potential predators call home. The story of Mary Vincent has been labeled by many as proof that evil does in fact exist in our world and that those who are responsible for these acts do not look like the monsters that movies depict, but instead they don't stand out. In fact, they blend in, appearing as anyone, someone who you could see at the movies or at a bar or at a football game. They are hardly ever easy to spot and rarely do these people allow anyone to see their evil side. Just like the three people that you are seeing on screen right now. Normal looking people, right? Would you be surprised to know that all three of them have one thing in common? They're all serial killers. Don't be embarrassed or feel dumb for not knowing. Because as I said, evil people don't just stand out as, well, evil. The point that I am trying to make here is that when Mary Vincent got into a van belonging to a man named Lawrence Singleton on September 29th, 1978, she had no idea that she was getting into the car with someone that many have since claimed to be a walking version of rage, hate, and you guessed it, evil. Mary Vincent was 15 at the time and was hitchhiking from Las Vegas, Nevada to Berkeley, California. An over 500 mile distance that would have easily taken her over a week on foot. Mary was going through a bitter time in her young life. Her parents were going through a divorce, her boyfriend had recently been arrested, and at one point Mary was homeless and sleeping in abandoned cars. Deciding that she needed to make a change for herself, she figured a new location to start over would be a great way to do that. So she packed what she had and started making her way to her grandmother's house in Berkeley, California. Hitchhiking along the way, and as risky as we all know it is today, it was simply a different time back then. She actually made it to her grandmother's, yet while she was there, she grew homesick and decided to hitchhike back to Las Vegas. A choice that would change her life forever. While making her way back home, a van slowed down beside her and offered her a lift. The driver was a man by the name of Lawrence Singleton. Appearing to be a friendly man, greeting Mary with a smile, and even telling her that he had a daughter her age and wouldn't want her doing something as risky as hitchhiking. He told her that he was going to Reno, but had no problem taking her to Las Vegas. Little did Mary know, but Lawrence was just out of his second divorce. He did in fact have a daughter Mary's age, but the relationship he had with her was anything but close. He also had a serious history with abuse. 
Mary was unaware of all of this as she got in the passenger seat. As the trip started, all seemed normal, yet things took a very creepy turn when Lawrence put his hand on the back of Mary's neck and asked if she felt all right. Mary, not liking to be touched, brushed away his hand and told him not to touch her again. Lawrence apologized and that was enough to Mary. She eventually settled in and took a nap. As the trip continued, the van eventually came to a stop and Lawrence told Mary that he had to use the bathroom. Mary exited the vehicle while he did this and began to stretch her legs. It was then that as she bent down to tie her shoes, everything went black. Lawrence had struck her over the head and Mary immediately fell into unconsciousness. The next thing she knew, she was in the back of the van and her hands were restrained behind her. What followed were acts so horrible, I cannot mention them on YouTube. I will just say that what happened to Mary in the back of that van are things that no person should ever have to experience. When everything was done and Mary woke up, the van had stopped and Lawrence was pulling her out of the van. On the side of the road, she begged him to let her go. She begged him to please set me free. Lawrence responded to this by walking back to his van and coming back with a machete. He then shockingly held Mary down and swung the blade at the ground, severing Mary's right arm just below the elbow. He then did the exact same thing to her left arm. He then pushed her off a 30-foot embankment into a ravine, and if that wasn't enough, he shoved her into a concrete pipe. Once that was done, he said to her, There, now you're free. Lawrence then left her there. Mary then fell back into unconsciousness. Lawrence started his van and then left, assuming that she would very quickly succumb to her injuries. However, as shocking as that encounter may have been, even more shocking was that Mary wasn't dead. In fact, Mary woke back up and actually made her way out of that pipe. Realizing the severity of her predicament and knowing she could bleed out very quickly, she acted fast and pushed the stumps of her arms into mud to stop the bleeding. She began to make her way out of the ravine and attempted to get someone, anyone, to stop. But the first car only saw a young girl missing both of her arms, dirty and bloody, and quickly sped away out of fear. The second car thankfully stopped and quickly helped her in the car and wrapped her in a blanket. They rushed her to the nearest hospital and on the way there, Mary again faded into unconsciousness. Once arriving at the hospital, doctors actually thought Mary was dead. But then when they saw her breathing, they immediately rushed her into the operating room as they knew she had lost a lot of blood and didn't want to risk her body going into shock. Amazingly, Mary survived. And not only did she survive, but she remembered everything that happened. And more importantly, she remembers the name and the face of the man who was responsible for this horrible crime. Mary was able to give a detailed description of the attack and of her attacker. She even had his name and with that information, police quickly went to work. They fortunately were able to arrest him and during this time, Mary was recovering. She received prosthetic arms and even returned to school. Six months later, once Lawrence was arrested, he was then taken to trial where Mary herself testified against him and pointed out that he was the man responsible for the attack. Lawrence, being the coward that he was, tried blaming both Mary and then making up that another person was there and that they were the ones who attacked her and that he had nothing to do with it. Given his history of violence, the description that Mary gave, and several other pieces of evidence, Lawrence Singleton was convicted but shockingly only received 14 years. It was the maximum sentence that was allowed at the time, but the judge actually went on record to say the following. If I had the power, I would send him to prison for the rest of his natural life. However, Lawrence Singleton, a monster who committed acts so horrible that they can't be mentioned, a man who changed a young woman's life forever, a man who showed no remorse and lied about even being involved, only served eight years before being released. 
Due to his poor health and good behavior, he was given an early release, but thankfully, his departure wasn't a smooth one. During his first year of probation, he was actually rejected from numerous different towns. In one instance, 400 residents of a neighboring town forced him out of the hotel that he was staying at. At another town, police had to actually intervene to get him to safety after the people of that town said that he wouldn't last a week if he stayed. He ended up having to serve his probation in a trailer, literally on the grounds of the prison, since nobody wanted him around. And to be honest, I can't blame any of them. And even then, the twisted story of Lawrence Singleton isn't over. After his probation was done, Lawrence eventually moved back to his home state of Florida, yet he was unable to stay out of police radar. He was arrested twice for petty crimes of theft and spent the next few years existing and unfortunately taking up valuable oxygen. He continued living this way until 1997. In the spring of 1997, a neighbor of Lawrence's called the police to report screams coming from his home. Knowing his past, police rushed to the house and were met with a gruesome discovery. Roxanne Hayes, a mother of three, lay dead on the living room floor of Lawrence Singleton's home. She had been stabbed numerous times. And when police saw Lawrence, they described the scene as him being completely covered in blood. Lawrence was arrested and charged with the death of Roxanne Hayes, and at his trial, someone from Lawrence's past came back to make sure that this time, he went away for life. Mary Vincent, who was now 34 years old, again took the stand and pointed out how he not only changed her life, but had now sadly taken the life of someone else. This testimony proved without any doubt that monsters like Lawrence Singleton do not deserve freedom they don't deserve life. Thankfully, the justice system had changed since back in the 70s and Lawrence Singleton was given the death penalty. He died in 2001 of cancer and I can say that the world is a better place without him. The true hero of this story is Mary Vincent, who since her attack has gone on to not only be an advocate for victims of violent crimes, but has also had two sons of her own. She is now an artist which focuses on powerful portrayals of female action figures. To add even more to her badass resume, she even has made customized prosthetics including one for painting and another for bowling. Mary Vincent's story is one that, while tragic, shows courage, strength, and the resiliency of human life. were four shocking stories and twisted tales. The stories of Ali Nassar Abulaban, Dorothy Jane Scott, Darsh Patel, and Mary Vincent are just a few of the shocking and unbelievable stories that have made their mark on history in one way or another. What may sound like something straight out of a crime novel or your worst nightmares can in fact be just as real as you or me.